Okay, so uh, this is the Transportation Committee, Wednesday, August 5th. We have two items on the agenda tonight. The first one, this is our second time discussing it, is Ordinance 2012, which is uh, relatively routine amendments to Title 15 of the Bloomington Municipal Code, so traffic, vehicles and traffic. And this includes some items like loading zones, no parking, zones, motorcycle parking, adding a temporary visitor permit, among other things. Second ordinance is 20-14, and this is again to am amend Title 15 of the Bloomington Municipal Code, and is to reflect a proposed redesign of 7th Street, known as the 7 Line. So for both ordinances tonight, we'll hear from staff, come to council for questions, go to the public for comment, and then back to council for a discussion and then potentially taking a poll on whether we wanna recommend these ordinances to council next week, or if we need any any further debate, at least on the seven line ordinance. Um, well, I think we also might have some amendments to introduce tonight. We'll just, we'll see what happens, right? I might introduce an amendment about motorcycle parking, um, uh, and we can go from there. Okay, Steve, Council Member Roland. Madam, Madam Chair, yeah. Uh, are we going to have separate votes on each uh, ordinance? Yes, yes, okay, yes. So, so we'll, first we'll, we'll do, do yeah. ordinance 2012 and then we'll do Good. 2014. Okay. Thank you. Okay, no problem. Okay, so let's begin discussing ordinance 2012, so amending title 15 of the code, vehicles and traffic. We heard uh, uh, from the staff last week, and I think this week, let me see. Okay, yeah, so this week we've got uh, two staff members present, I think, to weigh in on this. So if we, we've got Mr., let me see where I've got my guys, I'm sorry. Amir Farchi and Long Range Planner, and then Neil Copper, Senior Project Engineer. So, um, I guess where we left off, we, we had some updates to this and I'm thinking, would it make sense to have staff go through these updates and small edits and changes and we can ask questions again? Does that sound good? Okay, just a little overview again. Okay, so um, Mr. Farshi, do you wanna go ahead and talk about the updates over the past week? Uh, hello, this is Amir Fashji, Long Range Planner. Uh, let me share my uh, screen with you if that is okay. Yeah. Uh, Uh, could you see my screen, just to make sure? Yeah, yep, we see it, we see it. Uh, okay, great. Uh, so as a reminder, uh, staff presented the Title 15 ordinance uh, in the Transportation Committee meeting two weeks ago, I think uh, on July 22, 2020. Uh, the ordinance uh, proposes uh, various amendments to Title 15 of the Bloomington Municipal Code entitled uh, vehicles and traffic uh, about adding, removing, and changing some items uh, regarding no parking zones, loading zones, parking restrictions uh, for motorcycles and mopeds, uh, garage parking reserved for electric vehicles, uh, temporary visitor parking permit program, limited parking zone, speed limits, intersection, uh, one-way streets, and uh, changing a street name. The details and maps are included in the council packets. Uh, and for tonight, uh, staff prepared for amendments to ordinance uh, 20-12 to correct errors uh, contained in the original uh, legislation. Uh, let me talk about all amendments. Uh, so the amendment one, uh, which is submitted by a staff, and is in search of a sponsor is related uh, to the section two of the ordinance. Uh, section two is about adding some items to a schedule M 
entitled uh, No Parking Zone. Uh, the proposed amendment uh, makes two technical corrections by removing two blocks from section two uh, that were included by mistake uh, as follows. Uh, so the first correction is removing both sides of 18th Street from Grant Street to Lincoln Street. Uh, this is because parking was added on this street and uh, the code already defines the area where there is no parking on this street. So the block needs to be removed from Title 15. Uh, the second correction is uh, removing the east side of Washington Street uh, from uh, 19th Street to 20th Street. And this is because this block should be moved from section two to section three of the ordinance. Uh, the second amendment, uh, amendment two, uh, which is submitted by a staff and uh, is in search of a sponsor is related to the section three of the ordinance. Uh, section three is about removing some items from a schedule and point of order. Um, Madam Chair, maybe we should vote on each amendment separately. Uh, okay, how, how do you normally do the title 12, 15 amendments? I mean, that seems like a lot of, there's just so many here. Well, there's only five, but um, are there more than five? So, so, has four amendments, and I believe Council Member Rosenberger has one amendment. So six. Uh, it's I, just that, I fine. mean, at some point, we're going to need to have a procedural vote on each amendment. I just wanted to make sure that, um, you know, we're not sort of, I mean, we're not, uh, we don't have a consent agenda. That's my only concern. I, okay. I, can okay. Some, this is I can add some context. Um, uh, planning staff prepared four amendments that were released in the packet and uh, were seeking council sponsors for all four of those. I believe council uh, committee member Piedmont Smith offered to sponsor uh, one of those amendments, but I believe the uh, other three uh, may still be in need of a council or a committee sponsorship. Um, there were two additional amendments that I don't think have been, um, one may have been distributed in the packet addendum, I believe committee member Rosenbarger's uh, amendment and um, amendment five, which I believe committee member Volan uh, may introduce tonight uh, has not yet been released. So that's where we stand and uh, it's up to the committee if they'd like to get an, an overview of what the universe of amendments are before deciding whether to sponsor any of these, uh, but that's, uh, that's why the, uh, the staff amendments are, some three of them at least uh, don't have a sponsor yet. Okay, so if we're treating this as kind of a staff presentation, that I guess that, that's acceptable. Um, I'll just say now I'll be willing to sponsor the ones that aren't already. Thank you for, sorry for the interruption. And okay, I'm just going to ask if we need to have sponsors, do we need to do that today or can it wait, but if, in order to have a vote on it, somebody has to move it. Yeah, somebody has to to okay. to, to move and the amendment. So okay. I'm happy to do those. But okay, great. If you'll, if you'll we'll continue, take, yeah. Okay. Uh, Councilmember Pina Smith, I I wanted to request actually that we um, discuss and vote on the amendments one by one because okay. I'll have forgotten what the first one is by the time we come back to it, so. That's why I It should be pretty quick. quick. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so why don't we go ahead and go back and let's discuss. Madam uh, Chair, I will move one. Amendment 1 to Ordinance 2012. Okay, second. Great. I don't know that there's much to okay, discuss. Okay, there. So I mean, we're right. Is there any discussion? We can be casual here, I think. It's just correcting an error, it seems like. Okay. Although these are minor technical changes, I would suggest going to the public for, for each amendment. Um, right. Oh. Okay, right. Are. I'm sorry. I'm just like, okay, this is a random, this feels more random to me tonight. Okay. Um, if no council discussion, I'm sorry. And then Councilmember Smith, you heard, I need to make my screen a little bigger so I can see you. Um, there you are. Okay, so I can, any discussion from council members on that? No? no. Okay. 
Okay, let, let's go to the public on our first amendment. So for, for any member of the public that, that wants to make a comment on amendment one, uh, you can do so by either raising your hand uh, using the raise hand function or sending a message through chat to let us know that you'd like to comment. No one on um, the no parking zones updates. Okay. Okay. So I think we can go ahead and do a, a do pass vote on this. Do I record this or Stephen, do you record this? Typically the chair just calls on, on committee members and uh, uh, they can indicate well, or no. Right. I guess I just mean I should be writing this down for each amendment, right? Uh, the clerk is is keeping a record of of the vote. Also here, if you need me to do it. Um, oh, okay. I just I just want to make sure. So, I mean, we, I am assuming we're sort of going to be yes for most of these, but um, okay. So I'll just go ahead and call around council member. Oh, is this okay? Did I say this is a do pass for Amendment One? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, Council Member Smith. Yes. Council Member Piedmont Smith? Yes. Council Member Golan? Yes. And I will say yes as well. Okay. So now we can, um, that one passes for zero. Let's move on to um, Amendment Madam two. Madam Chair, I move Amendment. Uh -huh. I move Amendment two. Second. Okay, sorry. Any discussion, council member discussion? Um, let's go to amendment two. Do we want to hear from staff on this? Yeah, just briefly. Council please. member Bolin. Well, I think okay. he, he already presented on it and this is actually, he yeah, he said that yeah. the, the uh, text needs to be moved from one section to another. Oh. Uh, the previous ordinance struck out the one section. This one just puts it in the other. So if I'm wrong about that, he can correct me. Uh, it really should have been one amendment. Uh, yeah, the only addition is about uh, Grand Street, uh, the second uh, correction, which is about Grand Street uh, from 18th Street to 19th Street to change the east side uh, to both sides of the street. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, any other committee discussion? No. Amendment two? Okay. Go to the public, see if the public would like to weigh in on amendment two. Just updating some no parking zone. Anybody, I can't see because we're doing a shared screen. Um, Stephen, I trust you are checking. I see no requests mm -hmm. for comments on no. this. If, if folks have a request to make a comment on amendment two, you can raise your hand or type into the chat. And I'm not seeing anyone jump up and down. Okay, I think we're ready to consider a do pass recommendation for amendment two. Uh, I will call, okay, council member Smith. I'm eating my sandwich. Yes. <laughs> council member Piedmont Smith. Yes. Uh, council member Bowen. Yes. And Council Member Rosenberger, also a yes. Okay. Onward we go. What's next, everybody? I move Anyone amendment number three. On? Wait. Oh, yes. Um, I, I actually offered to sponsor oh. this one, but you can okay. still move it. Yeah. I'll second it. Okay. I'll second it. This is about the loading zones. Mr. Farshi, do you want to? Uh, sorry, the, sorry. Uh, yes. okay. the amendment three, uh, which is submitted by a staff and is a sponsored uh, by council member uh, Pittman Smith, is related to section five of the ordinance. Uh, section five is about uh, adding some items to a schedule O entitled, uh, entitled loading zones. Uh, loading zones uh, shall be in effect 24 hours a day, seven days a week, except where otherwise uh, noted in a schedule O 
and all uh, vehicles shall be limited to a maximum of 30 minutes use. Uh, the amendment uh, makes three corrections to clarify uh, the hours of uh, three loading zones uh, as follows. Uh, the first correction is adding the hours of 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday through Friday to the loading zone on uh, 700 block of East uh, 13th Street. Uh, the second correction is adding the hours of 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday through Friday to the loading zone on 800 block of East uh, 13th Street. Uh, and the third uh, correction is adding the hours of 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday through Friday to the loading zone on uh, 1600 uh, block of North Kinser Park. Um, okay, any committee member? Oh, we're still going. You're just scrolling down a little. Okay. If you have any questions, I'm oh, yes. happy to answer. Okay. Wonderful. Any council member questions on Amendment 3, loading zone? We kind of tackled this last time, I think, pretty well. Okay, anyone gearing up from the public for public comment on this one? Three, two, one. Seems like we're okay. I don't think we had any last time. Okay, I think we can consider a do pass recommendation for Amendment Three of Ordinance Twenty Twelve. Council Member Smith. Yes. Council Member Piedmont Smith. Yes. Council Member Volan. Yes. Council Member Rosenberger. Yes. Okay, this one passes as well. Four zero. Onward to Amendment 4. Who's our sponsor? Uh, I'll move it if nobody else will. Okay, I think that he did. I'll second okay. that. Is that okay? Okay. okay. <laughs> Can we have a presentation, please? Sure. Uh, let me present it quickly. Uh, amendment 4 is submitted by a staff, uh, is related to Section 6 of the ordinance. Uh, section 6 is about adding uh, motorcycle parking uh, restrictions to Title 15. Uh, the amendment uh, corrects a reference to a definition uh, within uh, the recently adopted uh, Unified Development Ordinance or UDO as follows. Uh, the correction is about uh, the term class two bicycle parking facility uh, shall mean a short term parking facility intended for a uh, relatively short duration as defined uh, by BMC uh, 20.11.020. And the correction is changing the BMC 20.11.20 to uh, BMC 20. Dot, uh, zero seven dot zero ten. Okay, let's go to council member discussion on this. Uh, council member Volan. Yeah, um, I would like a little bit more clarification on why we need this amendment. Not because I oppose it or support it, I just don't quite understand uh, what is the objective here that staff is trying to achieve? Uh, you know, the, because uh, the recent UDO Unified Development Ordinance uh, changed uh, some sections of Title 15, and I think this is kind of a recent change happens one month ago, maybe, or two months ago in the code, we realized that the reference to the Bloomington Municipal Code uh, need to be corrected uh, based on the UDO. The definition of class two bicycles, just the title of the code need to be revised to be a correct uh, section in the code. So it's only the reference to the new UDO. Okay, so this doesn't actually materially change uh, meaning, it just corrects an error? Yes. The definition of the class two bicycle is, is still the same in the code. 
only the okay. location that this section is referring to. As thank you. Okay, thank you. So, if you all can guide me on this as the chair, um, I, I I have an amendment to this amendment, right? So I have an updated version. Is that something we would discuss now? So I, I, mean, I, I think um, you're not necessarily amending this amendment. I think what you'd like to do is amend uh, the same uh, okay. section of code that that amendment uh, changes. So okay. right. um, the two amendments will need to be, uh, you know, um, obviously if, if amendment four is, is passed, it will need to be incorporated into this, this section as well. So um, I would wait to, uh, to discuss your changes after we've talked about uh, Amendment 4. Okay. Um, they are so related. I mean, I think in my discussion, okay, well, I'll, I, I think I'll just talk about it a little bit in this discussion of why I wouldn't recommend this one, right, and for my vote. Well, I, I assume that regardless of whether your amendment is adopted, you would want to correct this code citation Okay, okay, right. So oh, right, it's just that one little thing. Okay. Yes, we're, my amendment has that updated code citation as well, but oh, I see, because mine didn't because it was a little late in the day. Right, right, okay. That email came in during these meetings. Great, okay, so, okay, so this amendment is really just switching the code citation. It's pretty straightforward. Let's go to the public and see if anyone would like to comment on this um updated code citation amendment four is that i didn't ask i'm sorry you guys i didn't ask if we have any other council member comment also no okay okay i did get a, a message that uh aobon binder would like to make a public comment um although uh, he and other members of the public should know that there is i believe an upcoming amendment that uh, council member rosenbarger may be discussing that that uh, touches on this mm -hmm. section with a little more uh, detail. So, uh, Mr. Binder, you should be uh, unmuted and ready to comment. Thanks. Um, maybe I should just save my public comment for after uh, Council Member Rosenbarger presents her changes because it, it, it seems to me that the, the matter at hand right now is actually just pertaining to this one little bit in red. Is that is that right? Okay. I'll just, yes. if, if it's okay, maybe you can circle back to me. Yeah in a minute. Definitely. Just hang in there. Thank you. Okay, anyone else for Amendment 4? Okay, I think we can recommend a due pass for this uh, code update, Amendment 4. Let's go out of order this time. Uh, Council Member Volan? Uh, yes. Council Member Piedmont-Smith? Yes. Council Member Smith? Yes. And I say yes as well. So Amendment 4, the 4-0 due pass recommendation to go to Council next week. Okay, let's move to Amendment 5. Madam Council Chair, Member I'd like Roland. to move Amendment 5. I'll second Madam that. Chair, I'd like to move Amendment 5. And I'll use a second. second. Yeah. Uh, I said I second that, so we're good. Do, do I need a second? I'm not even sure, but okay. What is Amendment 5? Do we have an Amendment 5? So, Mr. Council Lucas, Member, could you circulate it? Council Member Volan, I'm, I'm working on posting that online for the moment. It may be easiest to share your screen. I don't know if you've got it pulled up or I can share my screen and, and display If that. you would share your screen, I don't have it on, on this device where I'm speaking. But it's going to take some explaining, and I'm not sure it's uh, obvious from just looking at the amendment. So. Uh, let me uh, explain the situation. So uh, the immediate problem that I'm trying to solve is that uh, the passage of Ordinance 1811 uh, created uh, the parking zone in Garden Hill. It's known as Zone 6. And uh, Zone 6 has been uh, more successful than, uh, than even I anticipated. Um, there are approximately 240 spaces in zone six on, on the street. That's the rough count that I have from planning and transportation. Uh, 97 permits were sold 
in that zone. Um, and the 2019-2020 uh, fiscal year. Um, and uh, so many streets went uh, empty as a result because this was also the first zone to be enforced at night and on weekends. So it's quite a bit more restrictive than previous neighborhood zones have been. Um, it has been, is met with the strong approval of the neighborhood association. They're very happy with it, but uh, questions have arisen um, among uh, residents who are not eligible for permits as to why if the street is empty, they cannot even have uh, visitors come and park there without threat of, uh, of a ticket. Um, and uh, so in a way you could say that this uh, ordinance is, has over-regulated uh, the zone. So one thing I'm trying to do is to uh, reach a, a closer to equilibrium with this by opening the zone up to uh, people who would not normally be eligible for a permit in the zone. In other words, specifically people who live in multifamily housing. But recognizing that there's a limit to uh, how much uh, parking there ought to be uh, available to, uh, I mean, in other words, without it becoming overcrowded like it was before Ordinance 1811, um, this amendment, uh, A, permits uh, 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 people who live in multifamily dwelling buildings to purchase a permit, but it also caps the number of permits at 250. Uh, but then it does something else new as an experiment. For this fiscal year only, uh, it would allow the first 150 permits to be sold at $46. Uh, this is a relative bargain in this area where um, uh, the market for private parking off street is anywhere between uh, 25 and $70 a month um, in garages and lots. Um, but because we don't want uh, to incentivize people to simply try to find the cheaper parking um, rather than uh, uh, the parking that goes with their apartment building, uh, it proposes an experiment that the first 150 permits will be sold at $46 which is the normal rate for a neighborhood zone. The second 50, the, the, the penultimate 50 permits will be sold at the rate for, of the all zone permit, $106 for the year. And the final 50 permits will be sold at double the all zone rate or $212 for the year. Uh, and this provision, this entire amendment expires February of 2021. So the, the goal here is to experiment with market pricing in zone six, so as to prevent uh, 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 multifamily dwellers okay. from buying up all the permits too quickly, um, but also sort of preserving for the intended users the original price uh, and intent. I mean, again, only 97 permits were sold last year to people in single family dwellings. So this should accommodate all of them. 75% uh, of permits are purchased in the first month of the school of the school year. The remaining 25, according to parking services, um, are purchased in January. And this is a rough number, of course, of people who buy during the year. But uh, because of this, I thought it was acceptable to uh, to to try this. We're also in uh, no ordinary year. It's a pandemic year, so we don't really know how many people are coming back to school this year. Um, uh, but with IU's new schedule, where uh, all classes will be online after Thanksgiving and before uh, February, this gives it an extra month in 2021 to, to play out. But I think we're gonna see the immediate results of it uh, within the first month. One more thing this amendment does is it, uh, it uh, incentivizes support for uh, the uh, market uh, pricing scheme by saying that every dollar after the first $46 per permit goes into a new fund specifically to make public works improvements in the zone where the permits were sold. So it's a, called the parking benefit district. The notion is one that uh, Donald Shoup promotes in his book, The High Cost of Free Parking. 
and it simply says that uh, the benefit should accrue to the place where the parking is being purchased. So basically, uh, the first $46 of every permit sold continue to go to fund the cost of, of neighborhood zone uh, enforcement and maintenance. But uh, if the 151st permit gets sold, the first uh, the, the, the first 46 goes to the regular use. The additional $60 goes into a fund for um, zone six for Garden Hill to repair sidewalks, to bury power cables, to repair curbs, to put up lighting. However, they see fit, of course, they'll be consulting with uh, public works, planning and transportation, and the decision would be made by the council. But this basically creates, it's kind of like a parking and increment finance district, the additional revenues uh, accrue to the benefit of the area and they stay in the zone. So if all 250 permits are sold, it'll, uh, I actually didn't do the math, 63,000 plus, uh, um, let's see, 6,000, it'll be about uh, $12,000 that could go to repair a curb or build a sidewalk in the first year. Uh, but I, we don't really know how many permits are going to be sold. Uh, we don't really know whether there's going to be a demand for it or not. But uh, one of the concerns that I heard expressed by many people wh who I consulted on the original idea uh, was that uh, it should be priced equitably. Mm -hmm. Originally, I had priced it uh, where people who are not eligible for a neighborhood zone permit could buy one, but only at the higher price. And so to address those issues, I've created this scheme instead. And my goal is to get it discussed. I, I don't uh, necessarily expect that it should or, or would carry favor. Um, when uh, the prior proposal was discussed in Parking Commission, the one that I proposed that had an elevated price for people living in multifamily dwellings, uh, it was met with a 3-3 vote. So uh, it did not pass, and did not, that did not find favor at Parking Commission. That's why I've changed the pricing scheme to the one you see, you, you've heard tonight. With that, I'm happy to answer questions on the idea, but I, before I do that, I'd like to get feedback from any member of staff who would like to respond to the proposal. And I, I will note that um, a link to the, <clears throat> to the amendment as a PDF was uh, sent out in chat and uh, through no fault of council member Volans, uh, we were, council staff was working on this uh, late today and, and didn't include this in the packet addendum. So um, apologies for the folks that are just now getting to review this. Does staff have any, uh, thank you, Mr. Lucas. Uh, does staff have any uh, thoughts about this uh, at all? Hi, this is Beth Rosenberger, Planning Services Manager for Planning and Transportation Department. Um, I have all sorts of thoughts. Uh, Good. <laughs> mainly, um, I know that Council Member Volan has been talking about this kind of in concept for, for some time. We've, we talked at the Parking Commission about uh, this or something similar. Um, it's sort of a challenge because we didn't see the amendment until now. Um, so, and additionally, uh, Michelle Wall, the parking services director can't be here tonight because um, she's out of the office. So I think it's probably fair to say, um, I'm not, I don't know, I'm not opposed to the concept, but concerned about administering this right now and concerned about um, doing escalating prices, I would say, um, when I, under, I, ca I think I understand sort of the market argument or, or to see how demand changes, um, but I would also be open to the same price for multiple dwellings and just see how many sell. Um, just opening it up since it hasn't been opened up in the past. And um, I'm a little um, apprehensive to limit the funds to only that district 
even though I think I understand the rationale and would be happy to learn more about it and talk more about it. But um, um, I think it, it gives me pause at this time. So it's something I want to consider more. I'd love to be able to address uh, Ms. Rosenbarger's concerns. Um, first of all, and I wish I had written them down because there's several substantial concerns, but I'll start with the technical concern. One of the biggest reasons why Ms. Wall was concerned about this ordinance when I initially proposed it was the what she thought of as the technical challenge of implementing it in our behind the scenes system that's managed by a company called T2. And uh, I think the, originally her problem was that in my uh, pr first proposal, it also allowed anyone, not merely a resident of zone six to buy a permit. Outsiders could buy a permit. And the reasoning at the time was that it allows people who are going to football games to buy a permit in the zone because that's one reason, that was one um, source of demand for parking in that zone was people going to games in the stadium. Well, Ms. Wall had also proposed um, a, a, a change to code that would allow for temporary visitor permits. And uh, I think that's actually in this in the, the ordinance that we're discussing. And those temporary visitor permits, they're actually a first and they're available across all zones, but they address the problem that I had originally been concerned about, that I wanted to charge a premium to outsiders who wanted to park in zone six to avoid paying 20 bucks at the stadium for a football game. But those temporary uh, permits do the job. And so uh, that was not necessary. And it was also technically complicated. So I changed it and that was her biggest concern with implementing it because you know we're close to uh, the beginning of the next year. Um, other concerns Ms. Rosenbarger have include, um, trying to remember them all. Um, so the, the pricing of the permit is equal for everybody. I, I want to make that clear. Uh, it's the first 150 permits that are normally priced, but the final hundred permits are at a higher price. So it's not exclusive to single family dwelling residents. Uh, anybody who lit has an address in zone six can now buy a permit. Um, but if they wait until the 150th permit is sold this year only as an experiment, they're gonna pay a higher price for one of the next 50. And if they wait until the 200th permit is sold, no matter what kind of building they live in, they'll pay the higher price, which will be uh, $212. So uh, again, we saw last year that only 97 permits were sold. So the demand among single family dwellers is more than met by this proposal. Uh, but furthermore, this is a sunsetted proposal. It's meant to experiment and to see uh, what is the demand in zone six for parking. If we don't do this, if we only price it at $46, uh, they'll all get snapped up um, and there, there will be, uh, we'll, we'll have learned uh, nothing from it. So here we've more than accommodated the single family demand and this is a matter of first come first serve, but it is, it is uh, certainly treats people equitably depending on what kind of building they live in. I've forgotten what other concerns Ms. Rosenbarger had, but I'm happy to address them. Thanks Council Member Bolin. I think, um, I'm sorry, because the ordinance does the reference to the fees, can you say them again? for me really quickly about how much is it for yes. the first 150 yes. people. And then my next one is, I can wait if you want though, but um, yeah, yeah, let me, restricting let me just the address funds that to be so used. Remember it. Okay. So again, the, the uh, regular price applies to the first 150 permits. But one thing that's important about the amendment is that it caps the number of permits where they weren't capped before. But the first 150, same price as before, like every other zone. Um, the, the, the penultimate 50 are set at the same rate as the all zone permit, which is what a permit that uh, uh, realtors or contractors buy that is also the same cost that fraternities in zone uh, five purchase 
or residents of Collins, they pay the, uh, the all zone rate. Um, and the last 50 would be at double that rate. So $212 in the 2020-21 academic year. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Next question. Okay. Yes, please. Um, it's more a statement, but okay. we're, we're, it was me expressing concerns about, um, and you could frame it as the number of variables happening at once. So it is increased, it is allowing more people to have access to the permits. It is also uh, doing an escalating price for permits um, based, you know, after a certain number sold. And then the, it, I can see it's not a variable, but defining it as a parking benefit district when um, my concern, I can state that my concerns on that are twofold. Number one, it will take a lot of time to generate money that could do a project. So um, I'll try to figure out what, you know, if you wanted to build a sidewalk, you know, we say sidewalks are a million dollars a mile. It's harder if it's smaller, sometimes it's more expensive. So that's going to take, I don't know. I guess well, if they're I actually could respond. $45. Sometimes, yeah. and then limiting it to the district. When I understand that there's more, it would show that there's demand for the parking, but it's not necessarily the place in the city that has the highest need for an improved sidewalk. Say there might be other neighborhoods that also need an improved sidewalk, but don't have the same parking demand um, to do that. They're related. Thank you. Okay, so the first. Uh thing was, uh, I've already forgotten it because I was listening to the second thing. Um, it, it's going to take a lot of time right, a lot of money. to do okay. anything infrastructure. Um, yes, so the money at first may be limited to repairs. Uh, you know, the neighborhoods like uh, Garden Hill have been accustomed to not benefiting from the sidewalk program because it only builds new sidewalks and most of the core neighborhoods have had sidewalks built out a long time ago, but repairing of sidewalks is another matter and they wait in line a long time for repairs. Um, uh, so, uh, but the important thing to think about this is that it's a demonstration project. It, it, I want to show that there is um, a demand for parking that isn't uh, appropriately addressed by our uh, current pricing that it's almost a subsidy of parking and that that street value is, is much higher than we're pricing it at. Uh, but, um, you know, I think that the neighbors would object very strongly to dollars generated in, um, you know, in this program going to other uh, neighborhoods. I think the only reason that they would accept it is because they know that they would benefit from it. This is the same principle as a tax increment financing district. Um, you know, instead of the money going to the state to be distributed generally, the money stays in the district where the taxes are generated in order to incentivize improvement. Uh, this is exactly the same principle. Um, so uh, I think it's, it's actually very equitable and that it, uh, it's key to getting acceptance from the neighborhood for it. Um, I believe that in every zone, um, the, 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 the residents of the zone should benefit from the zone. Um, because right now it's serving people who live outside the zone without compensation to the people in the zone. Um, you know, like the whole reason that the zone is there is to, was, was to prevent uh, commuting uh, back in the 90s, people trying to commute to IU from outside of it. So, um, you know, I, I think that uh, it's very equitable. It's good uh, economic policy. Um, I, can, I can understand why um, there's an argument that we should uh, spread the wealth, but um, I, uh, I don't agree with it. Um, I think that this is an important component of the notion and uh, wouldn't be viable otherwise. I think I've answered all of Ms. Rosenmarker's questions, but I'm not sure. 
Oh, I'm sure I have more, but I'm okay. okay. It looks like council member, uh, I know I'm not leaving this, council member Smith wanted to say something too. But Ms. Rosenberger, uh, council member Rosenberger, that's all I have for the presentation. Sorry to take, take so long. No, it's okay. I just didn't want to interrupt and want to make sure you got everything answered. Okay, council member Smith. I, I just kept waving my hand because I wasn't sure if- uh, I can see you. If, if you saw me. Um, you know, yeah. I, I have to say that uh, I, I'm totally in support of uh, council members Volan idea here. It seems just like a great idea. It seems like a great way to have kind of a pilot project to look at the market system and how that works. Um, and that the benefits are going to the people who bear the burden of all the extra people coming to park there. Um, I would think this would make the folks in the neighborhood thrilled that um, they're going to receive some benefit by having uh, people, interlopers, come and park in their, in their neighborhood to go to the IU games or whatever. It just seems like it's a great, it seems like a great idea. So I, I heartily support this. Is, is that a question? No, it was just a comment. <laughs> well, uh, I really support it. It's, a, Q &A. it's all right. Yeah. Great idea. We're Q&A, but it's, so, you know, it's 9.17. Well, We're casual here. It's 9.17. I, I want to emphasize something about Mr. what Mr. Smith said. Um, this does not serve people going to a game. It does not. There's a different, the staff has already proposed the establishment of a temporary visitor permit. Okay? Uh -huh. And that, like, you can buy a permit to park in Garden Hill on a game day if you want to. Okay. Uh, so I just want to make sure that that's clear. Uh, but also, um, I, well, I, I appreciate uh, the support. I just wanted to make sure that uh, it was known that uh, Garden Hill expressed to me their strong interest in the program. Um, because of these terms, uh, but I also recognize that uh, unlike the zone itself, this is an unusual, a, a, a particularly unusual proposal. And so I put a sense out on it to see what kind of numbers we get. But uh, if, if it's successful, I'm going to propose it across the board to every neighborhood zone. But the, the amendment only uh, offers it in zone six, and it's for zone six permits only. Thank you for that clarification. It's Thank you. Still a great program. Thank you. Okay. Okay, Council Member Piedmont Smith. Yeah. Um, I, I, first, I want to just clarify that the, the new temporary visiting parking permits can only be purchased by people who live in Zone 6 for even, I mean, they can live in multifamily residencies, residences in Zone 6 but they would have to live there to, to purchase a temporary visitor permit. So anyway, I just want to clarify that. Um, but as to this amendment, why charge more after selling the first 150 permits? I, I just don't understand the logic. That's a very good question and a complicated answer. Um, the, uh, when I was proposing a higher price for multifamily dwellers. Uh, everyone I talked to said, that's not equitable. Why are you charging more for um, people who live in apartments than people who live in houses? Well, it actually, that may be true, but right now there is no parking on the street for any reason from Thursday night to Sunday morning, uh, unless you live in a single family dwelling. Uh, so, uh, right now, people who live in multifamily dwellings are required, if they want to have a car, to park uh, in private off-street parking. And the market rate, the lowest rate for garage parking, for example, in that area is $25 a month. Um, and apartment complexes can charge what they want. So there's parking that's being completely unused on the street. That is, that if, if we continue for another year, will continue to be unavailable to anybody. And I'm not somebody who's such a, uh, an anti-car fanatic that I don't think we should use the resource that we have. So if there is demand for parking and we have 
supply that we're artificially keeping off the market, it doesn't make sense. So, but uh, at the other hand, $46 a year for a neighborhood permit is a significant subsidy to single family homes. And when the program was created in 1992, uh, I'm not sure that this particular facet of it was thought about that much. But since then, we have come a long way in the way we think about housing equity. And, you know, it just, this, this, we only raised the, um, the fee to what it cost us to manage our neighborhood zone program with Ordinance 1811. For 25 years, we charged $25 a year per permit across the board throughout the city uh, because it was completely arbitrary. There was no thought behind it. Now, at least the $46, which is escalating every 3% every year, at least it covers our costs. We established that about three, four years ago. But it's still a subsidy. It's still a subsidy to single family homes. There is no good reason why uh, people living in duplexes, quadplexes, multifamily apartment buildings don't have access to the street. But if we gave everybody in the neighborhood access to the street, we would be, the, the permits would sell out in no time. That's why there's a cap. And uh, so this provides us a unique opportunity to figure out what the market is in this area. The, the other problem with these annual permits is that you can only change the price once a year. Frankly, we should be going to a semester program for neighborhood permits. But until such time as we do that, this is a quick and dirty way, not only to uh, solve the empty street problem in zone six, but to do a brief market experiment and to see what is the price people are willing to pay for these permits. If we don't sell them all, then we know that maybe we're charging too much and there's not as much demand for it. But if in a year like this, where not even every IU student is coming back, that we still sell out of these permits, that's a sign that to the, everybody across the city that the neighborhood parking permit program is underpriced and needs to be raised to meet demand. Yep. So that's my long answer to it. I hope that suffices. I still don't understand. I mean, if you think there's such a high demand, then why not just charge $80 for all of the 250 permits? I don't, because I just, we just it, don't know. It, it just, it doesn't, I mean, there are some equity issues with your previous proposal, but with this one as well, in a way, it's just, it just seems arbitrary that, okay, what if I, you know, got a job at IU and I move here in November and there's only, you know, and I have, and I want to park my car in the street and now I have to pay $212 because I just happened to move to Bloomington uh, two months, three months too late. I, if the average, if, if the market price for parking in zone six right now is $300 a year, uh, you know, then, I mean, the program, the part that's inequitable is not this proposal. The part that's inequitable is the neighborhood parking zone itself, which is insensitive uh, to, to the demand. It's providing supply at a subsidized rate, but to change that program now is gonna take a lot more than this minor change, which is an administrative change that could be implemented by August 15th. Uh, it's just uh, offering uh, additional permits to people who weren't eligible before. Um, the, the, the concern that staff had initially was implementing it. And we worked out that uh, concern uh, at Parking Commission. But uh, make no mistake, the inequity of the program is the program itself and not this proposal. This proposal at least gives people a new choice, a less expensive choice uh, than any market uh, uh, available parking right now. But it, again, it also, um, it charges everybody the same price. It just, uh, after a certain number of permits have been sold, we know that there is demand and the price goes up. It's called escalating parking. We have other examples of it in code. We have escalating fines for noise violations. Um, if we know that, I mean, the, the big problem is what if we charge $46 and we sold 200, 250 permits? Um, we don't necessarily know who 
they went to, this at least puts some friction in. We're going to address the demand that we know the single family homeowners have. They're not going to be affected. Uh, there's at least 97 permits available to them. Um, but uh, every, for everybody else, you know, uh, including single family homeowners who didn't buy a permit last year, uh, at least it's, it, it treats everybody equally. Uh, it's a matter of first come, first serve. Other questions? I have some, but um, the other council members. Okay. I think, I mean, I think this is going to be hard to figure out for me tonight, but um, I, I, you know, I am still very hesitant on a different price scheme as it, as it goes. I mean, I, I know we've talked a little about just having one price the, the whole time, and I like that. Um, have you talked to people in the, in the housing other than single family to see what they think about this? No. Okay. I, mean, so, I, I, so will far say, in, I will say this. Yeah. I have received several emails from residents of Zone 6 who live in multifamily dwellings who ask, uh, I can't even get a visitor visitor to park here there's no way to buy a visitor permit and this ordinance is going to right. fix that but they also have asked me the question the street is empty why can't i park here now i have an answer to them uh, but the problem is if we offer more permits to this would be the first time that we offer permits to people who don't live in a single family dwelling we don't know what the demand is but i expect it's going to be much higher than the demand for single family in this neighborhood. If we put the price at 46 to everybody, I will withdraw the amendment. It's not worth doing. We need to find a way to control the demand for parking. You do that through price. So, um, right, and as, as Council Member Piedmont Smith asked, would you, is, is it possible to do something like $80, right? I mean, I don't, it's so arbitrary, but the same price for every single permit in this neighborhood. No, I would not. There's no. There's no basis for it. It's an arbitrary figure. We don't know whether it's too high or too low. That's why I'm proposing well, this three-tier scheme. But aren't your tiers arbitrary? They are, but they're tiered, and the first 150 <laughs> are the same price prices before. I mean, it, at least they okay. they escalate, so we can see if if the demand slows down. Uh, if it does, mm -hmm. then it's a clear sign that we shouldn't renew it. But if those pro permits sell out, even at the higher price, we've been grossly underestimating how much we should be charging for permits. We should be thinking about market-based pricing across all parking, all neighborhood zones. And so, okay, so you are worried that too many permits will be sold. And so you want to increase the prices, we sell more. Do we know the nitty gritty? Do we know how many spots are available and how many permits are sold now? how many non-single family home homes there are, how many of those folks have their own parking for one car, right? Do, like, we, do we know these? We know some of these things. We know that there are roughly 240 uh, spaces in zone six on the street, according to planning and transportation. We know from parking services that 97 permits were sold last year in the first year of the zone. And those permits, uh, of course, could only be bought by residents of single family dwellings. So we know what the demand yeah. is. And the first reason why this amendment came up in my mind was to say, uh, there's, this is one of the lowest uh, ratios of single family dwellings to all dwellings in a neighborhood zone. Uh, so we've addressed the demand for single family dwellings. And uh, my response to the concern about first come first served is, uh, we don't know how many houses, we don't haven't done a count of how many of them have off street parking, but that would be my answer to those houses that, um, that uh, you know, maybe don't get a permit this year at the price they were used to. Uh, if they have off street parking, they should use it. If they have a driveway, for example. But, uh, you know, we don't have that figure, but I still think that this proposal more than adequately addresses uh, concern over demand. It caps the total number of permits. It's uh, 
uh, only you know a fraction of permits above the total number of spots in the zone. So it basically doesn't oversell the zone, uh, but it does experiment with price to see. Uh, I mean, there, there is no better opportunity to do a market experiment on a permit that's renewed on an annual basis, except this. So we're providing as many permits as we provided last year and then some, but in case there's a, a run on permits, we can put the brakes on it through price. That's how you, you manage demand. The 97 permits, I'm sorry, this is my last question. I'm just, I'm right on this topic, I think, and then council member, if you want to The 97 permits sold, is that visitor and residential? No, visitor permits are now temporary and they can be, you can buy but, as many as you want. Okay, I'm sorry, I thought visitor permits are still annual and we're also adding in a temporary permit option, but I thought you could, re residents and single families homes can in the zones can still get an annual visitor permit. I think that the ordinance removes annual visitor permits in favor of the temporary, but I could be wrong about this. I haven't looked mm -hmm. at it lately, but I think that it revokes annual permits in favor of visitor permits, which are $11 per day, $55 per week, $110 right. per fortnight. Okay. okay. I'm going to let Council Member Piedmont Smith asked her question, and then I know staff member Ms. Rosenberger would like to comment as well. So um, we'll do that order. So uh, I wanted to know about the how you got the number of 250 as the limit of what multifamily dwelling residents could purchase in Zone Six. Uh, I didn't. You, you already said. You said that um, there are 240, about 240 spaces, 97 permits were sold last year. So those are to single family home residents. So that leaves, you know, about 100, 140, 143. So, but you're saying you want to sell a maximum of 250? So you are overselling the parking. Well, the, this is, goes to your concerns about equity. Uh, it does not privilege single family uh, residents. It doesn't reserve 100 permits, the 97 permits that they bought last year. Uh, so it simply says, I mean, right now there's no cap on permits. You, there, you can sell as many as people want to buy, but the only people who want to buy them in this zone bought 97 of them. And they're, they're, they're the, the ones who are eligible are single family homeowners. There are a whole lot more multifamily dwellers in zone six. But I'm not uh, saying that there should be a parking space for every multifamily dweller. I'm simply saying the other 140 or so, 150, let's make them available. Let's sell them. So 250 is the total cap, including the people who live in single family Correct. homes. Correct, so and it's when... first come first serve. So, okay. Well, then I have I mean, even more it, problems with it. So if somebody, it, you know, is on vacation until August 31st, comes back, they, they, they live here, they live there, they've lived there for 20 years, let's say, in a single family house. Now suddenly they have to pay $106 just because they were on vacation for, for two weeks or something. I, I mean, if we don't, if we if we treat single family homeowners differently, then it will be no less inequitable than your concern over price. I mean, uh, well, the... no, my concern over price is about first come first serve. I what if I mean, I, it seems just as arbitrary to me to say first come first serve. You know, up to a different price when we get down to. 100 permits left, then when we get down to 50 permits left, as saying, let's just make them all $80. So if we're going to do this as a pilot anyway, I would prefer to give one prize, no matter when you buy the thing, 250 permit limit, and just say $80, $85, $75, whatever. If we, if we price it anything below what the actual market is, the, the market will be overrun by uh, more opportunistic uh, people. And, uh, you know, people who are renting who didn't have, I mean, they're going to, instead of paying 200, 250 for parking, which they're maybe avoiding in Terra Trace or Brownstone Terrace, 
uh, or ho however much more it is in that. I mean, that's the, the low end of the market in zone six. Um, they're going to opt for this $46 permit. Even at $80, I think it's underpriced. Um, there's, a, there's a much bigger demand for parking in zone six, non-commuter demand than there is in other um, zones. Uh, I, because just because the sheer number of multifamily dwellings there. Um, but I mean, it's not worth it to make it available to everybody at $46. It will create, it will recreate the conditions that cause the neighborhood to request the zone in the first place. I wasn't so, proposing to make it $46 for everybody. I was proposing to make it $80 for everybody. But I mean, how, on what basis do you make that price and how do on we learn On what basis do you it? say that the first 100 people get it for 46 and the second 100 people have to pay more? I mean. Uh, I, I've, I've based it on two, on number one, the current price, the market rate for off-street parking and the escalator. It's the escalator that matters, okay? I'm admitting fully that the pricing is arbitrary because we have no other data except those two data points. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, here we're offering parking that wasn't available before. It was simply not, we, uh, the, the demand was 97 permits last year. That was the demand, but the streets were empty. So uh, you know, this is a way of, of uh, in a controlled experiment, seeing what the demand is in a parking zone. That has an unusual situation in the first place. It's like no other zone in that it's enforced at night and on weekends. So, uh, I mean, I, I, this has been, it's very complicated. I don't blame anyone for thinking that there's a certain apparent inequity to it, but it's sort of a, a quick and dirty experiment that we can implement right now for this school year that will solve the immediate problem of uh, empty streets uh, going, uh, looking for parking without overselling it. Uh, and with, by putting an appropriate amount of friction uh, on the final 100 permits that are sold. Uh, you know, if, if you're concerned about single family homeowners not being able to buy at $46, then you have to ask yourself the question, why are you prioritizing them over people living in multifamily dwellings? I want us just to be aware of the time. We have a few other things to get to tonight and it is uh, quite late. Um, and just a correction, so, Mr. Mr. Farshi has pointed out that uh, the temporary right. permit or the, the annual permit visitor permit still will be in this. They're not being canceled after all. Right. And that is only for single family homeowners. Um, I want to see if uh, Ms. Rosenberger wants to weigh in on this. She asked if she could comment. So Hi, yes. Um, well, I guess I'm not sure. It, my first thing would just be, I understand we just didn't get the amendment until right now. And especially with um, this wall out today, I think we would, I would say we're reluctant. We, I couldn't support it right now as is, and I definitely could not support it without um, her having the opportunity to review in public works as well. Um, some small comments I would make, they're actually just regular size, is uh, some points that were made was, uh, you know, about the money going back into the district, but the, the irony that the neighborhood parking permit program is subsidized by the entire city. So in no way does the cost of the permit cover the program right now, but then the benefit of that amount was going to the district. Um, again, I think I'm not all out opposed to a neighborhood or to a benefit district, but I, the whole city, all taxpayers then are still paying into neighborhood permit programs, whether or not you live in one. And the residents who do live there already do get a benefit and that their streets are enforced. So they have monitored parking on the street, which is a benefit. And then the other way it could be changed, of course, is just the reason this inequity exists is that code says it's only detached single family homes. That's a different change that could happen. And finally, well, maybe a couple other things. 
In the transportation demand management plan, it does recommend raising the prices for residential parking permits. It recommends, um, and this is based, this is based on analysis, to $40 a month. Um, it said raising it by $40 a month, so maybe that's in addition to the 45, but that's $480 a year. So <laughs> that is a much, uh, much different price, but I would say it's based on something. Um, and I think this also comes down to a bit of a, I want to call it a philosophical debate of whose street is it. I think it matters for the people who live on a street and in a neighborhood to get to weigh in, but it's also maintained by the city as a whole and, um, and also a public space. So trying to, to balance that. I do think the neighborhood zones have been useful as basically a transportation demand management strategy, like council member Boland said, so that people couldn't get free parking quotes next to campus. So it is a tool for that. Um, but anyway, that was a lot of points. Basically right now, staff can't support without some more time. Um, thanks. If I can respond yes. briefly. Um, uh, I agree that uh, Michelle Wall and Public Works should weigh in on this. I, I, you know, fully acknowledge that I introduced this at the last minute because I wasn't even sure I was going to introduce it. I, you know, have had to think about it a lot, and based on the conversation tonight, I decided to introduce it. So I'm totally fine with abstentions tonight. For me, it was more important that we discuss the ideas, and this was an opportunity to discuss it in committee. Um, number one, number two. Um, the, uh, the, the, this proposal already contemplates the cost of, of maintaining the program. When the Parking Commission did their first report, they found that the actual cost of uh, maintaining the neighborhood zone program was closer to $40 per permit, and they were charging 25. Uh, the, the Ordinance 1811 set the price to to fully recover the cost of providing the neighborhood zone enforcement program. So uh, this proposal does nothing to, in other words, no matter what the price of the permit sold, the first $46 continues to go to funding the cost of the program. Dollars above the cost of the program, the cost of the single family permit, or what is now the, the current permit price uh, would go to uh, the benefit of the neighborhood. So it's only surplus dollars. And it should make anyone who lives in that neighborhood feel better about the money they're putting into parking, knowing that the surplus, not all of it, but the surplus stays in the neighborhood. Uh, finally, the idea that uh, our plans call for raising street parking to $40 a month uh, is the best illustration yet of how relatively more equitable this proposal is. It's starting, it's an experiment to raise prices to see uh, if in fact the market will bear it. And this is the perfect test case. Uh, and again, it has a sunset provision of February 21. I am open between now and next week to adjusting any aspect of this, um, but the escalation is the feature, not a bug. Um, but again, at $480 a year, I'm, I'm proposing less than half that as an experiment for one year only. And we're gonna find out within the first month how successful it is. So with that, I'm uh, happy to, uh, to hear public comment. Thank you. Councilmember Rosenberger, I think your uh, audio cut out. Sorry, I was on, I muted because I was typing. Um, let's move to public comment, sorry. So if anyone out there would like to make a comment on this, okay. I, do, I see you'll have five minutes, it looks like, right? Okay. Mr. Greg Alexander should be unmuted and ready to comment. Thanks, um, hi, this is Greg Alexander. Um, I mean, this is a, uh, Progressive sign, you know, I'm I'm excited. Uh, we really do need to open parking up to more of the market and also approach market price, you know. Um, and 
Uh, I have uh, basically the same concerns staff did. You know, the the um, the benefit that the neighborhood gets is that their parking is managed. And so long as that parking is managed responsibly, I think it's it's they get that benefit. And so long as it's not ridiculously oversold, I think the people who actually you know live there year in year out, they're going to figure out what they need to do to get the permit to be first in line. Whereas people that rent, they're just going to come in in a wave probably at the end of July. You know, um, so I think probably the escalating price is probably overthinking it, but specifically the parking benefit district, like that was invented to overcome organized opposition from like a downtown merchants association. It wasn't meant to overcome uh, a neighborhood association. I mean, I, I realize it, it could, um, but the amount of money involved is just, it's a pittance. Um, this neighborhood we're talking about garden Hill, right? It, it desperately needs sidewalks on 17th street. Uh, which there are some sidewalks there, uh, but it desperately needs complete sidewalks on 17th Street. And it desperately just almost 80% of the residents every day that, that, that do walk to get to campus wind up walking just this ridiculous experience on Dunn that the sidewalks on Dunn and then on 13th and then um, crossing Indiana Avenue, it is it's embarrassing and it hasn't improved in the 20 years since I last lived in Garden Hill. It hasn't improved one bit. Um, and that's been identified again and again as, <laughs> as something that needs to be taken care of and nothing has happened because it's gonna take somewhere between a half million dollars and a million dollars to take care of that stretch of done. And we uh, allocating $20,000 every year or $50,000 a year if you're optimistic, I don't know how much money you expect this to raise. It just doesn't even make the slightest dent in that. And it's just ridiculous to give staff this huge overhead to to monitor such a tiny fund of money and then to coordinate with the neighborhood association and the neighborhood association is going to be like, what can we buy with this? And they're just going to be, you know, they're going to be flipping through the catalog to be like, well, what costs a pittance when what they have is this half million dollar huge gaping problem on done. And the city needs to solve that problem. The city just needs to solve that problem. Doing anything other than solving that problem is simply wasting time. Like we can't pretend we're at all serious about transportation if we are not even funding sidewalks on done that is such a crucial link between literally thousands of units of apartments including a thousand units that were approved just last year specifically because the sidewalks in this neighborhood are so good when there's not even sidewalk on done so we just need to do that and like having all this overhead debt and administrate such a small fund is not going to accomplish that um thanks a bunch though i'm real glad you guys are looking at this Thank you, Mr. Alexander. Any other comments? Public comments? I don't see any additional requests to speak. Okay, any other comments from council members on this? Council member Volan, go brief. Uh, just briefly, and again, I encourage uh, an abstention <laughs> To anyone tonight, I just want to have a discussion. But um, you know, we are going to have organized opposition from neighborhood associations if we touch the neighborhood zone program. Guarantee it. If you thought that uh, the uh, the debate over plexes was uh, concerning, this one won't be quite as dramatic, but it'll still be there. Okay, this is a program that serves uh, core neighborhoods. All right, so there's going to be organized opposition against raising the cost of parking on the street. Uh, I think that a parking benefit district will in fact be necessary, um, but I also think it's good policy. Like, you know, the, the, the people in those neighborhoods do have legitimate concern. You know, the parking should be market uh, parking, but uh, I uh, do not appreciate the idea that somehow uh, with all due respect to Councilmember Smith, you know, a neighborhood out like Park Ridge East is going to benefit from sidewalk dollars generated in Garden Hill. Um, I, the, Mr. Alexander is right about uh, the need for sidewalks on 17th, on Dunn, but there's a reason they haven't been built because the money hasn't been there. There's two ways you get that money. You either get a developer who's building new to add it as part of the cost, we, see, we saw that happen with the CDG project. They're gonna fix Project 19th Street, 19th Street. I've got it, that was sudden, I've got it. Um, or um, 
or you start funding it with this. And of course, this is a pittance. Of course, it's a pittance. Twelve thousand dollars isn't going to go very far, but it's a demonstration project. If you charge four hundred eighty dollars a year and you leave the first ten percent to funding the costs of maintaining the program, that's four hundred and thirty some dollars per permit times two fifty. That's uh, $100,000 or so. Okay, now we're talking six figures a year uh, from that demand that will fund sidewalks, okay? Um, th uh, this is, if, if we know there's a need in District 6 and we have a specialized way of funding it, it's no skin off of the rest of the city's back to fund it this way. It's money from the district serving the district. So with that, again, I, I don't mind uh, uh, abstentions. I would ask people not to vote no on it just wanted to have this conversation tonight. And I thank everyone for their time. Okay, thank you, Council Member Bowen. Any other comments um, since we only did questions earlier? Anyone, Council Member? Okay, I'll just say quickly, you know, I'm, I am for parking benefit districts and I'm for getting everyone an option to who lives in a in a zone to buy a permit no matter what kind of home you live in um i'd like to do a little more work on this this amendment though so i think for now i will most likely abstain okay um okay so let's do a roll call here not roll call sorry let's just do a poll um to do a recommend to pass um council member volan yes Council Member Smith, you're muted. Yes. Thank you. Council Member Piedmont Smith, you are muted. Abstain. As well. Okay, and I also will abstain. Okay, so here we for Amendment Five, we have two yes recommendations and two abstentions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so now we will move to Amendment 6. I'm sorry I have to be on speaker now. I cannot get my pods to reconnect. I'll, I'll okay. second your motion okay. of Amendment 6. I move Amendment 6. Thank you. Okay, so should I pull this up? Let me see. It This is an amendment um, that was discussed with me about motorcycle the definition of motorcycle as well as the definition of motor driven cycles so what let me see here should i share my screen is it, because this was sent out late in the day does it help to share yes everybody yeah okay you can share my screen um, council member if you want i have your amendment oh that would be wonderful thank you Thank you. That'll be easier for me so I can see people. Who, who can I ask who sent Amendment Six out? I'm trying to find it in my email. Stephen sent this was sent, sent it out in as the a packet addendum. The uh, packet okay, thank addendum. you. Yes, around 4:45, I think. Thank you. Okay, so this um this amends the motorcycle parking restrictions by adding in two new definitions. So in the original amendment earlier tonight, well, the original ordinance, we talked about motorcycles and mopeds and mopeds, but it, in the Indiana code, the Indiana code talks about motorcycles and then motor driven cycles. And what I'd like to do is just have our Bloomington code mirror the Indiana code <laughs> on these different types of scooters and motor driven cycles. So, I think this is important because um, you know folks who have scooters or mopeds in town, you have to right register them at the BMV or DMV, and um, so they use the Indiana Code to know if they have a Class A motor-driven cycle or a Class B motor-driven cycle. And so I think it makes a lot of sense just for our code to match up with the state code with these definitions. And in the previous ordinance changes moped wasn't defined so this really um, helps people with different types of motor driven cycles know where they are allowed to park right and know where they cannot park so um, 
this was, I just, we just sent this out today, so it is relatively new, but also relatively minor. I sent it to staff, and um, if they want to weigh in on this, that well, I would like to go to them uh, just to get their opinion. Um, so I'm not sure who would comment on this. Sure, this is Beth Rosenberger, uh, planning staff. We um, had seen a draft of this earlier and then got to review it briefly today. We also asked our Title 15 attorney, Barbara McKinney, to take a look. She was okay with it. Um, so other than that this includes an, the inaccurate UDO code reference, we are supportive. That's good. Thank you very much. And we, we have that other amendment that changes the code in this. So I think that they'll make one wonderful change together. So, okay. So I'd like to take council member questions here about this amendment. Council member Volan. Uh, just to, for clarity, a class one bike parking facility is like a locker high, like for long-term parking. Class two is like a bike rack. That's my understanding. I think staff could um, answer that as well. Oops. Oh, am I unmuted? You're unmuted. Sorry, I clicked something a little odd. Um, yes, that's correct understanding. We consider so when we're talking about class park. Okay. Class two is short term. So the U racks that you see around town, and uh, sometimes the U racks in corrals and so forth. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I do want to point out a, a change in this amendment. It is that if you look at letter E. The original amendment said no person shall park a motorcycle or moped on a class two bicycle parking facility. But we got rid of the word moped. I just want to make sure everyone is aware of this and said this restriction. So no person shall park a motorcycle on a class two bicycle parking facility. And then this restriction does not apply to a class A or B motor driven cycle. So this is saying that the little scooters, like the Vespas, and um, mopeds, so bikes with little bikes that look with pedals and motors can be parked at the U lock. Um, this, this was asked for by some folks who drive mopeds and Vespas because these are, these are sm very small vehicles that can easily be stolen and they need, need to be locked up. And uh, people who drive them try to park in high visibility spaces and this would allow them then to park <clears throat> somewhere right on the street like outside of restaurants and things where people can see their vehicle and where they can lock it up um, so that is a little different here these vehicles also don't tend to weigh very much so um, it's my understanding that they can lock up to u locks and other bike racks uh, in a way that doesn't damage that infrastructure. Other council comments? Comments Comment from staff? Wait, I don't think you're Wait, seeing yeah. me oh. for some reason. Oh, you're right. I couldn't. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm I, like I, waving ma, around. Ma, okay. I'm sorry, Isabel. I'm sorry. You can just, you can, okay, yes. Uh, council member Piemont Smith. Um, well, I, I think the biggest change here is something you haven't even mentioned, and that's um, that uh, letter D is crossed out so that um, motorcycles or mopeds could park in a regular vehicle parking space in a garage. Um, taking up a whole parking space, which is not very efficient in my view. Um, did staff uh, consult with uh, Michelle Wall or uh, anybody who, who works in the parking garages uh, uh, to, to get their view on this? Or did you, uh, Councilmember Rosenbarger? 
Well, um, what I did was send the amendment to staff and they just said they were on board with the changes. So that is what I did. Um, I, I, I liked that change because as far as I know, motorcycles don't pay a lower rate to park in a garage and then restricting them to only a few spots doesn't seem fair to me. Um, I also like the idea um, I mean, multiple motorcycles can park in one spot, so th that they tend to park next to each other um, because, like, if they're if they're riding with friends or something, they they share spots on a regular basis. I would say. Um, I guess I would also say because our garages have historically never been full, I am not worried. And like, even with the fourth street garage being gone, right, our garages are nowhere near full. Um, I'm not worried that we have a shortage of parking. Um, the staff wants to weigh in. Yeah, I'd appreciate um, that. Council Member Piedmont's next question. Hi, yes, this is Beth Rosenbarger. Um, I didn't notice that part of the change, so thank you. And I, so because <laughs> Michelle Wall is out, she didn't get a chance to review it since it came in today. Um, Rayanne Cox is on this call, and Rayanne, would you... Um, be able to weigh in on this and the change about motorcycle parking? Um, I can't weigh in on the garage. I don't have anything to do with the garages. Um, that would be a Michelle question. I think you should get her input on this. And Rayanne, to you, if I guess a moped is allowed at a bike rack, but a motorcycle is not, does that, if mopeds are lighter, does that achieve what you were hoping to achieve? Because this change did originate from parking enforcement in order to be able to actually um, enforce some parking we thought was illegal, but then dug into code and it was a gray area. So yeah, Rayanne, can you weigh in on that part too? I think mopeds would be okay. Motorcycles are a bigger um, vehicle and they're, they just take up more room and the, it should be for smaller vehicles uh, like mopeds and bicycles. We're promoting that kind of a transportation around town. So parking a motorcycle in there is not my opinion. It just takes up too much room. Okay, Council Member Volan. You're on mute. Thank you. I'm scrambling to find the, uh, in state code, the exact uh, dimensions of the definition of motor driven cycle. Um, and I'm not succeeding. Uh, in particular, what I'm looking for is should I assume that all the vehicles that we're talking about that should be allowed to park in, let's call it bicycle parking? Uh, are ones that do not require a license to be operated on city streets, like a motorcycle? Yes. Is there any vehicle that does require licensing that would be allowed to park at a class two facility? I wouldn't, I wouldn't want them in there, no. Well, it's, <laughs> I don't either. I'm just trying to determine whether that's what this code, this new ordinance proposes. Yes, I believe so. So those you're saying that a moped does not require a license and it could park there. A motorcycle does require a license and it should not be able yeah. to park there. There are different okay. there are different sizes of mopeds. Uh, it depends on the CCs. 49 CC. How about motor wattage if it's an electric bike that can go uh, 28 miles an hour. It's still, it's a class three pedelec, um, which is, you know, sort of like a moped. Um, but uh, it, they don't measure output in CCs, they measure it in watts. Mm. Do I have to worry about a bike that has a motor no. on it being classified? Okay, okay. So, no, electric bikes are excluded from the definition of motor-driven cycle in the Indiana Code. 
Really? Huh. All right. Thank you. And I, one other clarification or Stephen. Uh, go ahead. I was just going to say, I think class A motor driven cycles do require insurance and a license. So class B motor driven cycles do not. Those are the ones that have to have a max engine displacement of 50 cc's. And, um, but class A can be a little larger as my understanding. And they are defined by having a max horsepower of five. If this is all a little confusing to me, but um, those you need a license and registration. So it's, it's mostly um, that is just a, a five horsepower means it's like not a big vehicle and it cannot go like anywhere near a motorcycle. So that's like as fast. So that's like distinguishing a scooter from a motorcycle. And so a scooter or moped could fall into either one of these categories, class A or class B, depending on the max engine displacement. A scooter as in a okay. Vespa or a scooter as in uh, a Lime two-wheeled scooter? Okay, thank you. A Vespa. Council so member Piedmont Smith. I just did a Google search and both class A and class B motor driven cycles have to have license and registration. So, so okay. What Mr. Bowman was saying is, is not correct. So even when you do need a license, some of those vehicles you are, according to this amendment, going to be allowed to park in a bike rack. I wasn't saying it, I, mean, I was I mean, asking. Me, yeah, right. To me, a license isn't a distinction that matters. It's about the size, right, of the vehicle and like how much it weighs to park in the, in a bike rack. Um, I think we should check on that. I don't know, Stephen, if you have it. I know we're just getting into this today, but I am fairly certain you don't need a driver's license for a Class B scooter because it tends to be the vehicle of choice if you've had your license taken away. I mean, you still have to title it. I, I'm happy to provide uh, more information on on this before next week's meeting. Um, I do think there are things short of a, a typical driver's license that folks can have um, to be able to drive the Class B uh, uh, motor driven uh, mm -hmm. cycles. Mm -hmm. May I just remind my colleagues that we have a whole nother ordinance to discuss tonight? I know, I know, yes. Okay, well, if we can, if council is finished with questions, we can go to public comment. Is everyone okay? I can't see Ron, so speak up if you got something. No, okay, just because we're doing a shared screen. Okay, let's move to council com or public comment on this. Amendment six, motorcycles and motor driven cycles. Anybody out there want to comment? From, from Aabon Binder to comment, who should be okay. uh, unmuted now. Uh, hi, yeah, my name's Aabon Binder. I'm, I'm actually also a member of the city's parking commission. Um, and uh, I, you know, I confess that when the, the whole list of Title 15 changes came before the parking commission a few days ago, um, everything did seem pretty reasonable, but after, um, Kind of a second look, I, I admit I, I do kind of feel like I, I rubber stamped it in retrospect. So I, I do want to speak in support of Council Member Rosenbarger's changes, um, <clears throat> specifically on three points. So the first is that I, and this point has been raised before, but I, 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 really, I do want to drive it home, which is that motor driven cycles are often very lightweight and they are very easy to steal, um, either just by rolling them away or picking them up and you know throwing them in a, a larger vehicle. Uh, unless they're secured to something, um, just like how you would lock up a bicycle. Um, and so in practice, that's kind of just whatever is around, like a, you know, a signpost or a bike rack or uh, other fixture, but that's not always near a full-size car parking space. So, um, you know, I, I do certainly think that motorcycles, uh, which are, you know, typically a lot larger in size, would, would not be a good fit for parking in bike racks. Um, I just don't see the issue with motor-driven cycles as posing the same issue given that they are usually a lot smaller. I don't think there are any physical 
you know, size dimensions that are defined in law for that. Um, but there are power restrictions. And so from a practical standpoint, you know, they tend to be a lot, um, you know, smaller um, in physical size. Um, so the second issue, <clears throat> um, kind of to, to try to specifically uh, address Council Member Piedmont Smith's point earlier um, about the prohibition on motorcycles parking in car spaces in city garages. Um, I, I do want to point out that, you know, most cars that park downtown are only transporting a single person, the, the driver. So, so in either the case of a single occupant car or a motorcycle, using a, a given parking space, the outcome is the same. The space is serving a single individual person. So the, the difference between allowing a motorcycle carrying one person and a car carrying one person, allowing one and not the other becomes kind of just this sort of very abstract academic exercise. There's no practical reason. If you're talking about moving people, uh, you know, in both cases, the, par the parking space is, is serving one person. And, and I don't think staff is proposing making the garages uh, carpool only. <laughs> We're still allowing single occupant vehicles to park in the spaces. And so whether it's a motorcycle or a car, it, do it doesn't matter. One, one is you know, taking up less physical space, or it could, but I mean, in, in both cases, I mean, you should still have that kind of flexibility. Um, and then the final point I wanna make uh, is just to remind everybody that, you know, of course, obviously city code should align with state laws and definitions. And so as, as it pertains to, uh, you know, the definitions of MDCA and, and B, um, obviously that's a, you know, better choice uh, of language for the ordinance compared to, uh, you know, something like MOPED, which isn't defined in, in state law. So, so in general, I, I think that Council Member Rosenbarger's uh, amendment is, is, is pretty well thought out here. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mr. Binder. Okay, looks like we have another public comment from Sam. Yeah. Uh, Sam Welsh should be unmuted and ready to comment. Yep. Hi, hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, go ahead. Uh, cool, thank you. Um, thanks for letting me speak here. Um, yeah, I just wanna speak for a minute about uh, just as a motorcycle enthusiast, uh, motorcycles in general, um, that I wish there were more spots around. Like, um, it, I don't like parking, taking up a whole spot, but that's kind of what we have to do because as far as I can tell, there's exactly one motorcycle spot around the entire downtown square. Um, and I, I, I do park there. Um, I've often shared it with like two or sometimes even three other motorcycles. Um, so a little goes a long way. Like we don't need much, but um, a little bit more spots would be great. Um, and then it gets weird with who pays for the meter and stuff. Um, so yeah, I just think we should have more motorcycle spots in general. That'd be really great. And because when I have parked in normal spots, uh, I've actually had my bike knocked over because they didn't, whoever, I'm assuming they didn't see my bike. So now I have to park it towards the back uh, so that hopefully people see my bike and don't hit it. Um, so just in general, those are good. Um, I also agree with Aobon's statement uh, regarding uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Piedmont Smith's statement uh, about, you know, are we gonna require everyone else to carpool? Um, they, it's, it's hauling the same amount of people just because we can fit more bikes there or more vehicles there. Um, well, maybe we should have more motorcycle spots then. Uh, but so that's, that's that. I think we just need more motorcycle spots in general. Um, sorry, I'm kind of rambling here. Um, and anyway, I would just like to have more spots to encourage motorcycles and mopeds and obviously bicycles uh, just as a means of transportation, kind of a small part of the solution to climate change in general. You know, they, they require significantly less fuel consumption to move one around and uh, they are in a smaller carbon footprint um, and even less resources to make them. You know, there's just less metal, less rubber to make this thing. And also, uh, regarding electric motors, like motorcycles are going to be the are already the place where there are more and more electric options available. So we are going to want to be thinking about that too. Like um, there's actually uh, an electric Harley Davidson that you're going to want to think about. Like you probably that's the size of a Harley Davidson. You don't want to park that electric bike at your electric uh, bicycle rack. Um, 
but there's lots of other smaller electrical bikes that could fit there that are the size of a moped. So just to be thinking about that. Um, so yeah, that's sorry I'm kind of rambling here, but um, I just I want uh, I hope motorcycles are on, on our radar a little bit more. So thank you. Thank you very much. And up next we have Joseph, uh, who should be unmuted and ready to go. Uh, hello, uh, this is Joseph Nykam. Uh I support the amendment as written. Uh, I believe that it now balances the needs of residents who use motorcycles and motor-driven cycles and the burden on the city to accommodate them equitably with other modes of transportation. Uh, in addition, by implementing the state's definitions of MDCA and MDCB, the amendment as written provides clarity for enforcement should there be a violation against it. Uh, I also support more dedicated, secure motorcycle parking, both within garages and on surface parking, to avoid utilizing parking infrastructure intended for bicycles. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Any other public comment? Okay, I would like to go back to staff. I think Ms. Cox has a comment. Yes, most of our motorcycle uh, corrals are on the sidewalks. And in order to get to them, you have to travel on the sidewalks to get to them. So that's another reason not to have a motorcycle flying down the sidewalk is public safety. Uh, a smaller uh, scooter or moped would be easier to manipulate around foot traffic than having a motorcycle fly down the sidewalk to get to a bike corral. And then another uh, about motorcycle parking in the garage, um, most of the garage parking is on a slope. And anybody that's ridden a bike or has a bike knows that you need to park them on a flat surface. So I think having designated spaces in the garage would uh, prevent motorcycle damage and you, you just can't park them on a slope. That's it. Thank you very much. I just, yeah, I, I see those points definitely. I mean, I would say, I think we should have dedicated motorcycle spots, but also not limit them if they want to park in regular spots. I think they should get that option as well. Council, comments from council members, thoughts, concerns, questions? Council member Volan, you're muted, okay. Um, I mean, I'm generally inclined to this amendment. Uh, I have to admit that I still don't quite, I'm not satisfied with my understanding of definitions of terms like motor-driven cycle, uh, or that I understand the full dimensions of it, but um, in general, it, it seems like a um, an overdue change that would more equitably distribute parking for non-car vehicles, um, you know, starting with motorcycles and working their way down. So um, I'm sort of ambivalent whether I'll abstain or vote yes tonight. Like I, I'm supportive in general. I just want to fully understand the question. But uh, thanks for the amendment. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Okay, I think we can go ahead and um, do a do pass on this one. So I'll just go ahead, Council Member Smith. You are muted. Council, Council Member Rosenberg, will you restate what we're voting for after all that discussion? Sure, yes, we are voting on amendment six and this is um, this is defining motor driven cycles class A and class B. This is saying, it's not from here right the second, this is saying that um, motor driven cycles can park at bike racks and motorcycles cannot park at bike racks. And um, it is saying that motorcycles can park in any spot in a garage. I vote yes. I think I, okay. okay. Thank, Thank you. you. I think I got it there. I don't want to mislead you. I want to make sure I get it all out. Okay, Council Member Piedmont Smith. Yes. Okay, Council Member Volan. Abstain. Okay, and I will be a yes, it's my amendment. So thank you very much. Okay, we are through our sixth amendment. So help me out here. I think next what we have is to look at the whole ordinance. 
right? And do a discussion on that and um, and potentially do a, uh, a recommendation do pass for the entire ordinance. Okay, so do we need to bring it up in a certain way or can I just start discussing it? Steven? I don't know if staff uh, has anything else to add um, from, from last week. Uh, you may yep. want to ask them if there's anything else they'd like to present, but um, if not, uh, I would open it up to uh, any additional council questions, uh, go to the public and then come back right. to council for final comment. Yes, perfect, okay. So let's go to staff first to see if there's any additional presentation, overview, updates of the, um, the ordinance in general. For Title 15 updates. I believe uh, we only had uh, those amendments for you to present and we have nothing else to present tonight. If you have any questions about other stuff, other parts of the ordinance, the staff happy to answer those. Wonderful, thank you very much. The only thing I had thought about is, you know, it, it's, it's in stating the visitor, the temporary visitor <laughs> permit system parking permit system. Um, I think we were all pretty on board with that, but I didn't know if anyone wanted to weigh in on it or anything else in the ordinance. So just opening it up for council comment. Council member Volan. Uh, I'm glad that, that uh, staff proposed the temporary visitor permit system. I'm ambivalent about the continued existence of the annual visitor permit. Um, but mm -hmm. uh, I also think that we may find ourselves adjusting the price of temporary visitor permits too, because it's pretty steep even by my uh, measure. Uh, nevertheless, it's an option that didn't exist before. It's a welcome uh, addition. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing what other people have to say about it, but thank you. Thank you very much. Other council members? We're going cash here. It's comment or question. Um, Okay, <laughs> it's getting late. I am also excited to do the visitor permit system. I like that it's available to anyone, any resident in any in a zone. So it really opens up some options for folks. And I think we could over time, right, look at um, uh, getting rid of the annual visitor permit. The only thing I would wanna ask, but I know Michelle is not here, are we looking at all at selling booklets of visitor permits? I think, and maybe that would be something we want to do next year, but I think that would be a way to get rid of the annual so that people still have the convenience of potentially buying 10, you know, five or 10 visitor permits. And like once they write the date on it, stick it in their window, they wouldn't be able to use that again kind of thing. And they wouldn't have to come to city hall every time they get a, they need a visitor permit for someone. So I could see something like that being good down the road. It's okay for not now, though, I think. Just a thought. Okay, any other council comments on the entire ordinance? Council Member Piedmont Smith? Yeah, for the uh, temporary visiting visitor permits, um, it says any any resident in the zone can apply for such a permit uh, depending on availability. So is the number going to be limited? I think this is a question from Ms. Cox. I think I might have gone through this last I time. I can provide an answer, I think. Uh, actually, Michelle should speak for that and uh, Ryan Cox can also speak for that. But I think uh, the main reason was that it's the first year of this permit and uh, I think the parking services wants to evaluate the needs and because if they uh, if they over uh, sold the zone, it may cause some problems. So this section can provide uh, parking services director to decide, for example, how many permits they have sold and control the numbers and have some kind of limits for that. But, uh, Ryan can provide, Ryan Cox can provide more information, I believe. No, that's, that's. Ms. Cox, you muted yourself. Yes, he's right. We're going to see how many are sold to see, you know, how it works. Thank okay. you. 
And Clerk Bolden, did you want to weigh in as well? I was just going to add some more context. But that's fine. Okay. Okay. Great. Okay. Other council questions, comments on the ordinance? Did you raise your hand? Okay, Council Member Bolin. A short comment. Um, what Ms. Cox just said underscores the effort I made with Amendment 5, which is uh, we don't know the demand until we're going to see what the demand is. That's why I'd urge consideration of that permit in the same way. That's why I support both of those permits. Thanks. Thank you. Council comments. Okay, I think we, we can open it up to the public for comments on ordinance 20-12 amending updating title 15 traffic and vehicles like mr alexander uh, mr alexander who is now unmuted awesome go ahead thanks uh this is greg alexander here again um i really respect your stamina um i i'm interested in section 10 which uh removes a few streets from it's called schedule i and it's uh basically there's a 25 mile an hour speed limit around the city and this lists streets that have exceptions to that um and there i looked at the original schedule it has if i counted correctly 55 street segments that are above that 25 miles an hour that means that the uh, the existing Title 15 specifies that the speed limit is going to be above 25 miles an hour. Um, and that's a concern to me. Um, the, the transportation plan calls for every street in the city having a speed limit below 25 miles an hour, except for three. And those three are the, the State Road 4546 bypass, um, State Road 446 over on the east side. Um, and both of those are, are INDOT, so we don't need to be concerned with them in local ordinance as I understand it. And then the uh, the other is is um, Walnut north of the bypass. But every other street in the city is supposed to be a speed limit 25 or below um, according to our transportation plan. And I, I, I assume that staff had that in mind when they recommended reducing the speed limit on, on the five segments they've identified. Um, and so I'm really excited that they're beginning to do that, but uh, we could just get rid of that whole list, everything that's over 30 miles an hour or higher uh, could just be removed from that list today. Um, and it wouldn't take legal effect until, you know, until Public Works gets around to replacing all the, the different street signs. But we could send that signal. Um, there's no reason that staff has to lead and council has to follow. Council could lead on this and then staff could follow. And this is important because every time like some little thing shows up, like on Rogers, we've added bike lanes in different segments piecemeal over the last about eight years. Um, there's been uh, crossing at Rogers at 4th Street as one independent project. There's a school zone project at 8th Street where my kids go to school at Fairview Elementary, and that's pursued as an independent project. So each one of these little projects, they don't ask the question, should we reduce the speed limit on the whole corridor of Rogers, which, you know, in order to improve safety for, in order to install a bike lane, you have to decrease the speed limit. That's the most important thing for bicycle safety. In order to install the school zone crossing, you have to decrease the speed limit. And so ironically, as they installed the school zone crossing, they actually installed brand new high visibility, 30 mile an hour speed limit signs one block away from the school. And that defeats the purpose, you know, they should just, when they, when they have this, they shouldn't ask, will we ever reduce the speed limit? They should know, yes we are going to reduce the speed limit, make that decision for them, make it easy for them so they don't have to go and try to justify it and do a traffic study to justify it and re-examine the whole corridor from, from you know Clear Creek on up. Just say all these speed limits will now be 25 miles an hour. And I mean, we, we really should go a lot further, but, but it's gonna be complicated, you know, but the new traffic plan says a lot of street typologies should be 20 miles an hour. And it would be nice if that was, you know, happening on a, a quicker time scale. Obviously, that's going to be more work. But it's just so easy to just identify the ones that are 30 or 40 miles an hour. And we can just strike those from the list right away because there's no reason for any car anywhere in the city to be going 30 or 40 miles an hour. Um, thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other comments on the ordinance? What comments? Okay. Back to council for final comment here. Okay, let's do a due pass recommendation, right? On ordinance 20-12. 
Okay, Council Member Smith. Yes. Council Member Bolan. Yes. Okay, Council Member Piedmont Smith. Yes. Council Member Rosenbarger, yes. Okay. <laughs> okay, so that wraps up our first order of business here. Let's move in to, um, I guess I just didn't wrap that up. It's four yeses on that. Thanks. Okay, so let's move into the seven line, right? Do we have a time limit on this call? We just get to go forever here as long as we want? Uh, okay, we're the know. last meeting. We're the last uh, committee of the night. Um, we didn't advertise yeah. a stop time, um, but right. I don't know if anybody wants to stay much longer. I mean, generally speaking, no, right. 11 o'clock well, we'll is a, a goal. Right. And well, we didn't have a lot of council questions ahead of time on this, so maybe we might uh, get it done. Okay. So now we've got, let me pull up everything here. We've got our second order of business here, um, um, ordinance. 20-14, this is to reflect a proposed redesign of 7th Street. So again, changing our favorite Title 15 and the Bloomington Municipal Code. I think we have uh, Beth Rosenberger here to present on this and answer questions as well as Neil Copper. Thanks everyone for sticking around until 1032 to get this going. So first I'll open it up to staff to do your thing, a little presentation, a little overview, whatever you'd like, answering questions right off the bat. <laughs> Hi, this is Beth Rosenbarger. Um, obviously, there are more people on this call. Out of the council members here, how many of you have seen a presentation about the seven line already? One, two, all three, four. and I'm pretty sure council member Bowen has as well. Yeah. Okay, all of us. Okay, um, let's do this. So I was planning to do an overview of the project first um, because it does address some questions. Basically, I like to start over here at the B line on the Western side of the project and move East. Um, and I wanted to look at the project first and then talk about why second. And um, I can go as fast, uh, I can try to go super fast, but I also want to kind of make clear this is a big project. I think it's a really exciting project. And I know it's 1030 at night, so I don't want me moving quickly to kind of feel like it's getting short shrift, you know. Uh, yeah, you know what? Government takes no breaks, so just take all the time you need. We don't even know what sleep <laughs> is, so feel free. <laughs> so um, <laughs> this is from the Parking Commission presentation, so Councilmember Bowen will be familiar. Basically, why we're here is this is the city's second protected bike lane project. This is the first protected bike lane project where we are also asking to remove on-street parking and we are asking to modify some stop signs along the route. Those are the two bigger requests that have implications for Title 15. So that's why we're here. We want to get um, approval in order to move forward with the design of this project. Basically, if, if, the, if the parking removal cannot be approved, the project can't move forward. So we wanted to bring this to council now and, uh, you know, get that conversation going since we want to finish the design and get construction um, bid for the project this fall to be constructed summer 2021. That's next summer. Okay, so on the left side of the screen, we see the proposal includes adding an east-west stop sign on 7th Street and removing the B-line stop sign. I have all the measurements in here. I'm not going to read them, but if you have questions about them, I can address them at some point. At the intersection with Morton and 7th, the proposal is to remove the east-west stop sign. Um, if there are specific questions about the stop signs, I think Neil Copper will be best to answer those. There was um, a traffic analysis study done on this corridor. And I think most people would be surprised that 7th Street carries more volumes already than, um, than any of the cross streets where we're, 
we are requesting to remove the stop sign. You also see a raised crossing here. That's exciting. That's raised for the bike, bike lane and the pedestrian. Um, I'm happy to talk about how that improves safety. In the next block um, from Morton to College Avenue, you'll see Throughout this corridor, the two-way protected bike lane is on the south side of the street. And what makes it protected is that there are physical barriers uh, along, along the corridor between the bicycle facility and motor vehicle traffic. In this um, block, it would be reconfiguring the angled parking to have parallel parking in this section here. And um, there's one loading zone space that is used quite frequently, we're, we're, we think, um, by the hotel, and that loading zone space would remain. Um, in addition, the changes at the College Avenue intersection are some protected corners here, as well as a bicycle signal. None of that is part of the Title 15 change at this moment. In the next block, from College to Walnut, uh, like the other block, Starting in this block, there's no on-street parking at all. Uh, currently, there's on-street parking on the north side and the south side of this street. One question that I received from Council Member Piedmont Smith was, does this remove ADA spaces and what is the plan for that? The proposal impacts four ADA spaces along the corridor. I know two of them are in this block. One of them is in a place where it could be put uh, just with the reconfigured parking. And um, the others, we would look at just a location very nearby on a cross street to add a new ADA space um, for the ones that are being removed. So we'll continue moving um, east. In the next block from Walnut Street to Washington Street, this, uh, you know, we see this, I'll do it without, on the south side of the street still. Currently, there's some parking in this block as well, um, in existing. This has a nice wider median. Uh, we see trees along there. One question was, what will be in the median? And I uh, failed to create a list of all of the options but there are multiple options. We do know we want to put trees in anywhere we can put trees in. They help provide shade and they help um, reduce stormwater impacts because they capture stormwater. We could use pavers because they're lower maintenance. We are also working with CBU to look at green stormwater infrastructure options and if that would be in some of the medians or at a different location. Another question was about the bus stops. And, um, and bus zones in code. So this is one of the bus stops. This is a floating bus island. And also the tool design memo noted two things, that a driveway at the southeast corner of Washington would be removed in order to accommodate the bus stop. That was wrong in that it meant the southwest. And then it turned out being wrong in that we're not proposing removing it because of the amount of reconfiguring that would have to happen in that parking lot. Um, so there are four current bus stops along this corridor on the south side. This plan uh, um, combines two of those and results in three floating bus stops. They are all different lengths, but the design is similar um, in that each of them has a raised, well, uh, sort of bicycle speed bump that bicyclists will have to go through in order to be alerted of the conflict and to yield to pedestrians. And then they are all curb height as well, so it makes for faster and easier boarding and alighting on buses. In the next block, um, just a pretty typical cross section here, there are some breaks in the barrier for driveways and alleys. This shows these driveways is closed and that is not, um, that's not worked out yet. We are working directly. There are only three properties where we are proposing to uh, change or eliminate driveways on 7th and we are working directly with the properties, the property owner or the representative in certain cases. Um, so this, Next to First Presbyterian Church, they have three parking um, lot entrances. 
uh, is one place where we're working with that property. We honestly haven't, um, we're circling back with them soon and proposing one option. They will more than likely still have at least one driveway opening onto 7th Street, um, but we are just trying to work with them to make sure it can still achieve what they want from their parking areas while um, trying to really minimize the number of cuts and the width of cuts along the corridor to focus on improving safety and comfort as well. I think that answered another council question. So we'll continue as we move east. Um, this block, this is another one of the driveways you might see over on the left that I'm um, working with that property owner to see if it's feasible to close or relocate. And I think nothing major of note that we received questions on here. This block is the Poplars building at IU. We see another bus stop here. So floating bus stops in code. The reason bus zones are codified is because you have to um, delineate curb space where there is existing on-street parking and clarify that, slash codify, that other private vehicles can't park in that space and that it's for buses. In terms of when the bus stops in the street for boarding, we do not have that in code. Um, and I would say the answer to that is just, it's a policy decision. They could be in code, they aren't in code. Um, there are 500 bus stops. So that would be great as a map if it were to be in code, I would say instead of a table. But that, um, let me know if you have more questions on that one. Uh, I forgot to mention the stop signs as we traveled through. I'm sorry. So with the exception of the two signalized intersections, College Avenue and Walnut, each intersection since then, Washington, Lincoln, Grant, and now Dunn, the proposal is to remove the east-west stop signs and keep the north-south stop signs. In most cases, they're a one-way street, so just obviously the stop sign being on the side that has um, traffic. So this next block done to Indiana is where the design changes because the amount of available right of way changes. So the median gets much narrower. It is still a physical barrier, um, like a raised curb here, but there's not the flexibility to put trees or something within that space. And the same as we continue east until we get to Woodlawn, there was a comment at the public uh, at the public meeting we held about how would you move from the bike lane if you wanted to turn north onto Fest or Park or turn from one of those onto the bicycle facility. We're checking out the design to probably add some brakes in the barrier to facilitate that movement as well. And then uh, once we get to the intersection with Woodlawn. This is um, a bus stop that can accommodate two buses. Maybe I should ask Neil to correct me if it's actually three. Um, and so this one is the one that was being combined with a bus stop that was um, closer to Park Avenue. And Bloom we've worked with Bloomington Transit on this project. They are completely on board and were supportive of combining these bus stops as well. At Woodlawn Avenue, uh, Sadly for now, the project ends and the street transitions to IU property. Um, so I think I'll briefly cover the why because it's fun. So the real question, I like this chart a lot. It takes a minute to take it in, but it's basically if we're, when we talk about transportation, we're talking about moving people through space and also being in space. But when we look at one lane width of a 10 foot lane and look at how efficiently you can move people in that space, the chart at the top shows that private motor vehicles, you could like move 600 to 1600 per hour, depending on factors. Mixed traffic would be private vehicles with buses is 1000 to 2800 per hour. A two way protected bike lane is 7500 people per hour. Um, and that is what we're proposing here, a two-way bike lane that is uh, mostly 10 feet or more. A dedicated transit lane is 4,000 to 8,000. And a super efficient use of space is a sidewalk, which is 
10 feet of sidewalk, which you could say is also on this corridor because we have five feet on both sides, is 9,000 people per hour. So um, I understand we are asking to remove on-street parking, but in terms of a corridor and the ability to move people, I think this project has a dramatic impact on the ability for the number of people who can move on 7th Street, both in um, a safe and more comfortable way. So when we consider that it has sidewalk on both sides of the street, a two-way protected bike lane, and mixed traffic with frequent buses, um, it'll be a very efficient corridor in terms of multimodal transportation. And I think that is, um, especially due to having the bike protected bike lane, that is, will be unique for our city. Um, in terms of public transit use, this is a really high transit use corridor. There are four bus routes that travel along here, 10 bus stops, which with our combination of two stops would become nine. There are almost 300 bus trips a day and about 3,400 passenger rides per day pre-COVID. And the buses have five to 10 minor collisions every year. The main reason they have these collisions is because of adjacent on-street parking. Narrow lanes are really great for slowing traffic, but they are not great for buses, which are larger when they're adjacent to a vertical barrier, like a parked car. It makes it really challenging for the buses. If the lane is narrow with a curb, but not with something vertical next to it, like a parked car, if they aren't those, the buses can deal with narrow lanes still because it's their mirrors that are the main issue. So multiple questions on parking. There are currently 121 metered parking spaces on the street. We're requesting to remove 113 of those metered spaces. In 2019, those 121 meters generated $160,000 in revenue. I'm gonna go through these numbers fast, but you know, feel free to ask me questions. So based on 121 meters for a year and the total amount of revenue possible, the meters generated revenue 35% of the time. In parking, um, in like typical parking best practice, which is more about managing parking, and I would say less about climate change goals, parking best practices aim to have parking utilized 85% of the time. Uh, we do know that in 2019, the combo zone was in effect until August, and it applied to 55 of the meters. The combo zone was where if you had a neighborhood parking zone permit, you could park at a meter without paying. So some spaces were taken up until August, uh, assuming by people with a neighborhood zone that were not paying a meter. Uh, Council Member Volan requested more data about it. Oop, it's my next slide, though. And just to clarify, in addition to the metered spaces, there's one block of zone parking that accommodates about 13 vehicles um, based on that it's about 265 feet long. Dunn Street, we are adding 11 metered spaces and 33 zone spaces um, with a recent Title 15 change to add parallel parking to that street. So Michelle Wall did get this data pulled from IPS and Park Mobile. So a quick summary is that IPS is the meter data. Park Mobile only goes by the block. So it has to be combined then. And to compare when the zone, when the combo zone where people were allowed to park at a meter with their neighborhood permit to when they weren't allowed to. Um, if we look at this 2018, five month total was $62,000. And then 2019, the five month total was 66,500 and change. So the difference in those five months from the year where the combo zone applied to the year where it didn't was $4,445, um, give or take. So I can also talk about why we build protected bike lanes. Um, mainly, when we think of people driving, there we build one type of thing, and we understand how to build something for driving. But when 
we look at people bicycling, there are lots of different user groups. So this, they actually usually talk about a one percenter, which is somebody who is probably a rider with the Bloomington Bicycle Club who will be very fine biking on almost anything. The highly confident is the user group we've basically captured with the infrastructure that we have in Bloomington. This means you'll bike sometimes on bike lanes or without a bike lane on slower streets and things like that. But what we want to capture with our infrastructure are people who are interested but concerned. And when you build for this user group, the rest of those users are also comfortable and accommodated. Um, and that would be best described by somebody biking with a child, somebody who doesn't want to bike next to moving motor vehicles, which is uh, a pretty rational concern, and people who will bike on the B line but won't bike anywhere else in town. Um, this is the basics of what a protected bike lane looks like, but since we've gone over our project, um, I'll just say it's a sidewalk, a space separating the sidewalk from the bike lane. We've got the bike lane, a physical separator, and then the space where cars also move. A really important thing to note about protected bike lane facilities is they improve safety on the street for all users. So over here in this little blue box, we can see that protected bike lanes um, have been shown to re oops, reduce serious injury and fatality collisions for people biking by 90% and reduce fatalities for all road users by 44%. And we think a lot of this comes from separating the modes and um, creating conditions where people drive more slowly and safely. Also, there's a benefit to pedestrians by separating people bicycling. When people feel unsafe, they bike on the sidewalk. So when we see people biking on the sidewalk, it's usually not because they want to be there, but because they feel unsafe or uncomfortable with their other options. Again, this accommodates micromobility. So I keep saying bike lane, but people in scooters can use this. And then it frees up the sidewalk for people walking with strollers or um, just walking and want to be not encountering people on bikes. Um, why is it on the south side of the street? There are fewer cross streets. There were fewer bus stops. It's a direct connection to campus and it minimizes the drainage impacts because when you start um, looking at drainage and curbs, projects get more expensive. So also the project works within the existing curbs and mostly just adds the median along with other changes. But we uh, for the most part, are not touching the outer curbs on the street. So you see this design throughout the project. This is called a protected corner. And the reason it's a great benefit is it improves safety for all users within intersections. When you're a driver and there's no corner, you take a right turn at a... Um, how would that be? I want to say sharper angle, but it's very hard as the driver to look over your back shoulder and try to look for someone in a bicycle lane. In designs like this, it puts you more at almost 90 degrees to the bicycling crosswalk and to the pedestrian crosswalk. So the bicyclists have greater visibility to drivers and drivers are easier to see much more. Raised crossings also make people more visible. Um, Finally, don't forget about those great comprehensive plan goals that were adopted. So increasing sustainability, improve public transit, improve the bicycle and pedestrian network, prioritize non-automotive modes, protect neighborhood streets, optimize public space for parking, and educate the public. In the memo, I described, I think, how this project touches on a lot of these goals. And while I think, um, I would argue this project is optimizing public space for parking because we know this parking is underutilized and there could be a more efficient use for this space. Um, the Trays District Garage will pl plans to come online in spring 2021. This project, the plan is to construct in summer 2021. Um, while sometimes those are kind of considered different user groups, a garage is still adding inventory to the parking system. 
Um, okay. And then Neil, do you want to, let me see if there were any questions. Estimated completion date, turning movements. Okay. Oh, the estimated cost of the project is $2 million. And for the meter data, I can send um, the spreadsheets if you want as well. They're not that fun, but um, sometimes you want to see that. Neil, would you like to talk about turning movements? Yeah, Neil Copper, planning and transportation. I'll try to share my screen real quick. All right, so um, the question was, how do you make a turn from the two-way protected bike lane? Uh, there's actually a kind of a lot to go through with that answer. Uh, I'll try to go through it pretty quickly, but let me know if you have questions. Um, so there's two reasons, uh, two primary reasons where you might ask that question. Um, one is because of the physical separation. So instead of being a traditional bike lane with just paint on the ground, you have a physical barrier separating the bike lane and the motor vehicle lane. So how does that come into play? And then the second aspect is because it's a two-way facility, uh, so you have bicycles going in uh, what you would think of as the, uh, the opposite direction on that side of the road. Um, so I'm going to start with a question about the physical barrier. So uh, on my screen is a graphic. Uh, this is from a publication out of New York City, but uh, describes kind of your standard, what they call vehicular style turn that a bicycle might make. Um, in the image that you see, obviously making a right-hand turn is pretty straightforward. I'm not going to go into that. Uh, making a left-hand turn um, in a traditional bicycle lane, you would merge into traffic, merge into the left turn lane, and then follow the signal or stop sign or whatever, whatever it was you needed to follow. Uh, with a physically protected bike lane, that can be more challenging to do because there's a physical barrier there. Um, it can still be possible, of course, if you choose to exit the, the protected bike lane in an alley or a driveway or something. Uh, and experienced users may do that. Um, but in general, what you would do, uh, this next graphic, uh, what they call, uh, here they're calling it a pedestrian style turn. Uh, commonly it's referred to as a two stage turn um, because you're, you're making the turn in two different stages. So you actually um, act as though you're going straight through the intersection, uh, stop on the far side of the intersection and turn, uh, and then you wait for the green light or wait for your turn if it's a stop sign. Um, and so instead of merging with traffic, you do this type of turn. You can do this um, whether it's a physically protected bike lane or not. Uh, often a less experienced cyclist will be more comfortable doing this turn uh, even from a traditional bike lane or without a bike lane present. Um, in order to make this, uh, this kind of movement more intuitive and to help with uh, kind of education on that front, um, it's common to do what's called a two-stage turn cue box. So in this image you see it's basically just painting a box on the ground showing a cyclist where they might wait in order to make that two-stage turn. Uh, this image is just a one-way protected bike lane, but I thought it showed it pretty well. Uh, you basically find a spot for that box that is out of the flow of other bicyclists and also out of the flow of conflicting motor vehicles. And it's a clear spot for you to wait where you're gonna make your turn. This is just an image on the 7th Street proposal between College and Walnut. Um, so if you, uh, look at the Walnut intersection, you can see in between, uh, uh, if you're going eastbound as a bicycle, there are places where you could pull to the right or to the left. Um, we can put a two, plan to put two stage turn cue boxes there to, um, to, to show where you would wait as a cyclist in order to make that turn. Um, one of the, some of the comments we got after the public meeting was that those weren't shown on these graphics and we are planning to flesh that out further um, and give some of that guidance. Um, in the opposite direction, if you're, uh, so in this graphic, you're a westbound cyclist, you're kind of what you might think of as on the wrong side of the street. Uh, it's the same general concepts. So if you are westbound and you're making a left turn, uh, it's relatively simple. You're, you're crossing the opposite direction of bicycles, but otherwise it's similar to if you're going straight across the intersection. Um, and then if you're making a right turn as a westbound cyclist, uh, it's similar to the two-stage two turn where you actually turn and stop, except that you don't have to cross the intersection first. You would just pull straight into that two-stage turn cue box. Um, I also want to point out that uh, anyone who's ridden a bicycle on a, one of the multi-use paths we have in town, 
This is basically the same thing that you would do uh, if you're riding on a multi-use path. Those are two-way facilities on one side of the street, uh, except we're trying to give a bit more definition here. Um, and then, you know, the, some of the other differences between a multi-use path is, of course, you're not mixing with pedestrians while you're doing it. Uh, and you're arguably more visible as you're kind of in the roadway. That's all that I had. Okay, thank you very much. We, staff is finished. We'll go to council, council question. Council member Volan. I have one question. Um, when uh, will, traffic counts be done after the project is done so we can see the difference in uh, not just car but bike and maybe even pedestrian traffic on the seven line. So we actually have um, we have existing permanent bicycle counters on 7th Street um, I think east of Indiana so that would be we'll reinstall that after the project and that would be an ongoing count for bicyclists. Um, that does not count pedestrians. Pedestrians are more challenging to count, and it also doesn't count motor vehicles. We have uh, we have data on the street from our before condition. Uh, you know, typically after a project like this, we wait at least six months uh, to let people get accustomed to the new configuration and change their travel habits, things like that. Um, so I don't have an exact date of when we would get counts, but we would definitely want to evaluate it. But the key thing is that you will be doing those counts. Yeah, we would. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Other council questions? I don't have a question. I, I just have a comment. Looks like a great project. Okay. Thank you, Ron. We, we should go to the public Thank first, I think. Think. I know. Right. I know. What was that? Okay. Um, we'll go to the public for comment on ordinance. It looks like we have Greg Alexander so far. Okay, Greg will unmute you. Looks like we're all set. Hi, I'm Greg Alexander again. Um, I just wanna say, I know you all are used to a lot of negativity from me, but this project is awesome. It's um, it's everything that our side paths aren't. Um, in our side paths, we, we resolutely, you know, what makes those inexpensive, the reason we have them is that we don't re-engineer the intersections. We don't even re-engineer the driveway crossings and it's, it's really dangerous, but uh, on, it's actually more dangerous than riding a bicycle in the street, which is flabbergasting for me. But this project is the exact opposite. The, the intersections are meticulously engineered. And even, I, you know, I have some reservations obviously, but um, overall, this is just, this is fantastic. I'm so excited to see this. I have been waiting um, 10 years for, for good design to start coming out of the city engineering staff. And this is a good design. Um, and this is made possible, I think, by the, the transportation plan. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mr. Alexander. Any other public comments? Comments from the public, okay. Uh, we, we do have a request from uh, Aobon. Oh. Right. Should be. Okay, go ahead. Ready to go. Hey, everybody. Aobon oh. Binder again here. Um, well, I want to echo Greg, um, of course, about how just overall this project is great. Um, it's it's certainly a very ambitious project, and I'm very excited to see how it turns out. Um, I I think it is important to get all of the details right uh, in the design of this project. The devil's really in the details, and and, and design details can can really matter a lot uh, in terms of safety and, and usability and how intuitive the whole uh, system is to use. And, and so I, I just wanna just make one comment about the, the Eastern end of this project where it transitions to uh, university property. Uh, and and I, I think that there are probably still some design changes that, that you know, should, should be looked at, possible design changes, particularly, um, you know, when, when you have this, uh, this kind of, I don't even know what to really call it because it's not a really, it's not a standard kind of bike facility, but it's, it's sort of a on-street bike lane that crosses diagonally across the intersection. And I, I not only don't think, I, I, I not only don't think that a lot of people will necessarily be comfortably using that, um, at least as it's intended, 
um, but also it just introduces a lot of potential for conflict between all the all the different modes. I mean, pedestrian, bicycle, um, all the buses, of course, um, other other motor traffic, um, because it is such a, I guess you might say, unique kind of facility or a unique kind of design. Uh, <clears throat> I, I don't think it's very intuitive to use because cyclists going westbound uh, from the north side of the street, uh, transitioning to the south side of the street to the two-way path, sort of have to plunge headlong into the intersection into oncoming traffic. And I mean, if, if I were using this facility, I, I don't know if I would think, oh, I, I sort of need to treat this like I'm turning left because I'm crossing into the path of oncoming traffic. So I need to like signal left as if I'm turning left, but I'm not really turning left. I'm just going straight. And, you know, I, I don't think that's going to be very clear for, for anybody, uh, you know, to, to really know what to do based solely on having the green, uh, you know, dashed paint on the ground and stop signs, because I, I just don't think <laughs> that either of those types of intersection treatments are really intended for this kind of uh, per, this kind of intersection where you are transitioning between, uh, you know, traffic on both sides of the street to bicycle traffic on one side. So I would really encourage uh, staff to look at like international best practices because this type of intersection, you know, we're, we're obviously not the first ones doing this kind of intersection. There are many examples around the world, uh, you know, it, cities across across the world where you are transitioning between those those two types of uh, like cycle tracks or, or, or bike paths or, or bike lanes. And, you know, some of them involve kind of doing a whole sort of protected intersection where you're, where you have a kind of two stage turn process built into the intersection. I mean, that's, that's certainly how like, uh, you know, a lot of like Western European countries would probably design this intersection. There's probably other ways to do it too. Uh, maybe, maybe relocating the transition altogether just outside of the intersection so that you're not having all of these different confl conflict points introduced right at the point where people are trying to just <laughs> continue going straight. Uh, but, but what I, the, that's, that's kind of really mainly what I'm concerned about with this project is, is just uh, that, that, that is such an important connection point, uh, you know, because it's, it's where, it's where users of this, of the seven line are going to be either entering or exiting campus and I think the point where people are going to be leaving campus is, is also just, you know, it tends to be a, just a high, really high traffic, high conflict area. So everything that we can possibly do to reduce conflict and improve safety, you know, particularly at that Woodburn intersection, I think would be really helpful. But, you know, again, overall, I think the general overall design of this project is great. I think it's, you know, for the most part, it's very well thought out. Um, but I, I would really please strongly urge staff to do some more attention, give some more attention to the, the east end of this project. And, and, you know, hopefully, I mean, you know, within the next few months, maybe IU will budge and, you know, there'll be, uh, you know, di different ways to kind of approach that than, than having this kind of rough transition. But, you know, in lieu of that, I, I hope that the, that the other plans can be made for, for smoothing that out. So thanks. Thank you very much. Any other? Comments from the public? Looks like that's it. Okay, we'll go back to council for comments. Any other questions, final thoughts? Council member Piedmont Smith. Yeah, just very briefly, uh, I think this is a really exciting project. Um, and I really would like to wholeheartedly thank uh, Beth Rosenbarger for her presentation because she answered all of my questions in the course of her presentation. So I really appreciate that. That's really great. Submitting questions early, it's useful. We're doing great. Okay, Council Member Volan, you're muted. Just wanna say it's unprecedented, it's exciting, and it's overdue. I'm very happy to vote for it. I do agree with Mr. Binder's concern about the interface at the east end of the project. There's got to be a way we can maybe design a better bike box to make that transition better. But otherwise, I can't wait to see this thing in place. Thank you. Thank you very much. Looking forward to this kind of project becoming precedent. You know what I'm saying? Okay, any other comment? 
Okay, I think we can do um, do a due path recommendation here. Okay, Council Member Piedmont Smith. Yes. Council Member Golan. Yes. Council Member Smith. Yes. Council Member Rosenbarger, yes. Okay, those four yes, yeses, and we'll send that back to Council uh, next week. Okay, so where are we? I think we can just say wrap this up. Yes, okay, wonderful. So thanks everyone for coming. We will consider this adjourned and see everyone who knows when. Okay, bye, thanks for being here. Hey, thanks everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you.